Hey guys, Masako X here, and uh, April Fools! We're gonna be dealing with a certain thing that people have been asking me to do, and I've really been putting it off because it was incredibly dumb. But this is the day of being dumb, so why not? We're doing What If Broly Turned Good. But Masako, Broly's a movie character! How dare you make him canon! Um, I think you'll find it's April the 1st, April Fools says we can, and so we are. I'm going to be taking certain liberties with the script, try and mesh the movie and the TV series into one, so we, we can be a little bit crazy here. And given the fact that the beginning of this story comes from the 10th movie, Broly's Second Coming, the only DBZ movie I have yet to watch, and I'm planning to keep it that way. Picture this. It's after the 8th movie, Broly the Legendary Super Saiyan. Broly's been defeated by Goku, somehow an involved green goop. Broly somehow managed to survive? Find a pod? He was incredibly injured though, to be fair. I mean, you know, green goop does that to you. And it somehow took him conveniently to Earth. I mean, to be fair, it happened to baby Goku somehow ending up on Earth, so I guess it can happen twice. As I've heard and seen in clips, Broly gets entombed in tons and tons and tons of ice. However, in this scenario, I'm going to have it so that means when Broly lands, there is a massive avalanche. So Broly does try and escape the pod, but he is met with head injury after head injury. So you know what happened with Goku, but there's no time to think about that. He is knocked back into the pod. It closes. It gets entombed. Stasis status. So, you know, he's frozen in suspended animation and that's him done for several years. As far as I can remember, it's something to do with Goten crying about not getting any apples or being really hungry for apples. It somehow causes the ice to crack, revealing Broly escaping from the pod and taking Goten by surprise. However, unlike the movie, Goten's crying doesn't send Broly into a whirlwind of rage and thinking him he's a young Kakarot. He reacted to it because it was potentially someone who could support him. So Broly, instead of just shouting, Kakarot, he's just going, help, help. Hours later, Goten never heard him. He just went back to get some apples, I don't know. Broly's still crying out for help and eventually it's just like very weak, help. The following morning, Videl can sense something weird going on in the forest, which is Broly by the way, and feels like Goten and Trunks should go and check it out because they could take on pretty much anything. When Goten actually concentrates and focuses on the weird energy going on in the forest, he recognises it to be something like of a Saiyan, but it's very weak. It must be someone hurt. When he eventually comes across the injured Broly, Broly looks up and spots Goten. Goten asks whether this guy's okay. He doesn't know that this is Broly because... He doesn't want know specifically what he looks like. And instead of getting angry at Goten and going off the handle like in the movie, he just looks up and just goes, Kakarot? Goten is aware of Goku's name, Kakarot, but isn't familiar with the actual background behind it. He's just going, No, I I'm Goten. Goten. Ugh. And then passes out. Goten then begins to panic, not knowing what to do. Has this guy died? Is he just unconscious? What's he gonna do? He, he could take this guy back to Videl, but she might be all lame and stuff, and this guy might not be able to be trusted or something like that, so he's gotta think of something else. So instead of getting Videl embroiled in all of this, he rushes back to the camp at full speed and wakes up Trunks, going, Trunks, Trunks, you gotta come help! This is something really, really happened in the forest, you gotta check it out! And Trunks like, what? Weird stuff? Yeah, cool. I'm really bored anyway. Trunks is willing to go, but he's kind of suspicious when Goten asks him to grab a blanket, some food, and things that they could prepare a little fire. Broly is still unconscious at this point, but he is breathing. Barely. And Goten wraps the blanket around him, and Trunks prepares the fire, and they kind of get some food cooking. Broly briefly stirs from his slumber after the smell of food. Calmly eats some of it, regaining some of his strength, but then falls back asleep again. Goten thinks that they can't leave him here like this. He might just freeze and die of starvation. He doesn't know what to do. So Goten then suggests that maybe he should take him home. And Trunks is going like, I don't know, Goten. I don't think your mom's going to be really happy about this guy suddenly going into your house. I've got like a forest nearby our house and we just leave him there and I can bring him food every day. 
They pick up Broly and what remains of the food and the supplies, bail on Videl and actually head to Goten's place. They safely make sure Broly's okay and then walk back to Goten's house and ask Gohan whether he has any of those sensu beans knocking around during Goten and Gohan's training because they do do that from time to time. Gohan makes sure to have a small supply ready. Sure enough, Gohan does have some left, albeit just a couple. As Broly regains his strength, he's able to sit up for a little bit, wrapped up in the same blanket, all dazed and confused. Grateful for Goten's presence, but unable to really process what's going on. Goten and Trunks are getting really excited because this guy can talk. They're asking him all kinds of questions, where he is, who he is, what he came from, all this kind of stuff. Is he good? Is he a Saiyan? Can he go Super Saiyan and stuff like that? Broly doesn't know how to think about all of this. He only knows two things as of this point. He remembers that his name is Broly and that he has to find someone called Kakarot. Kakarot give Broly answers. Kakarot help Broly. Goten take Broly to Kakarot. Goten gets a little sad about this because, unfortunately, Kakarot, or his dad, is currently dead and he's never met him before. Broly is saddened by this news because one of the things that he remembers is kind of fruitless. But then Goten thinks, well, we could bring him back with the Dragon Balls and stuff, I suppose, because Goten doesn't really remember the fact that Goku chose not to be here. Broly like plan, tiny Kakarot. Goten, in a fit of excitement, then whips back to their house and asks Gohan where the Dragon Radar is. Now Gohan's getting really suspicious, you know, first Sensu Beans, then Dragon Radars? Why? Goten doesn't like confrontations and immediately kind of gets all sheepish. He then retreats from the room. Gohan thinks that he should start keeping an eye on Goten because he's being really shifty at the moment and he wants to make sure that he and Goten don't get in trouble with their mother. However, Chi-Chi begins to notice something weird in Goten as well because he's really off of his food. He's not eating as much as he used to and he's a half Saiyan, remember? But little does she know, Goten's actually packing it away in a small bag and then taking it to Broly to feed it him in the forest. As even more days pass, Broly regains his strength and eventually he is able to fend for himself, so Goten doesn't need to do that. But a lot of this time, Chi-Chi gets very concerned. But that being said, Broly still appreciates the visits with Goten and Trunks. They're his tiny friends. And the recovery isn't just his physical strength either. Those sensu beans that Goten gave him was also really good in helping his mental capacity regain strength as well. So he will be able to improve his lexicon, the way he speaks. It'll come back to him. However, things begin to take a turn for the worse when Gohan finds out that Videl was bailed on by the kids when they went to Natale village. Why would they leave Videl all alone in the middle of a village like that for no reason? So he immediately confronts Goten and demands an explanation. Like I said before, Goten doesn't really like confrontations. So after trying to be all stubborn and ignorant, he eventually coughs up and says that they found something and it's in the forest and they wanted to make sure it was okay and offers to take Gohan to it. When Goten approaches Broly, Broly can sense Goten's presence and immediately comes into plain view, thinking that, ah, oh, Goten, you come back. But when Gohan strikes eyes upon Broly, he's just horrified. B Broly? G Goten, what have you done? Gohan immediately powers up to Super Saiyan and Broly cowers in fear. Gohan then prepares an attack, trying to finish Broly off, but then Goten stands in the way. But Gohan is extremely determined. This is the same Broly that he, Vegeta, Piccolo, Trunks and his own father tackled seven years ago. He is not going to let this guy get away with this. This is the perfect chance. He's weak. He's feeble. He doesn't know how to go Super Saiyan, so it seems. So yeah, it, they could be rid of him once and for all. Goten then looks to Broly and then to Gohan. He's absolutely confused, but resolute in protecting his new friend. If he were truly evil, like Gohan claims it to be, would he really allow Goten and Trunks to survive when they first saw him? You know, that kind of stuff? Gohan pauses for a moment thinking about this, and then Broly says his piece. Broly friend, Broly need to find Kakarot. Kakarot has answers. Broly's beginning to feel a little threatened, and this triggers some inert power inside of him. He can feel it rising and rising. Goten can sense this and begins to panic. He turns around to Broly, trying to calm him down. Judging by Goten's behavior, Gohan can sense that his little brother's telling the truth, but remains focused and determined to stick his ground. If this guy truly is different from the monster that I remember, tell him to stand down now! Broly then looks to Goten, and then to Gohan, and immediately, he powers down. He reverts back to his base form, 
and then walks calmly back into the forest. Goten then turns back to his brother and looks mad. You scared him! He was just afraid! He was trying to protect himself! How could you? He doesn't remember a thing before he found him! The only thing he remembers are his name and to find Dad! D dad After much debate and toing and froing, Gohan offers to keep the secret and not tell anyone else about Broly's presence on Earth. Because if he did tell anyone, then the likes of Vegeta and pretty much everyone else would descend upon Broly and destroy him. The pair settle their differences and then head home, with Goten just turning around one more time and going, Broly, before walking back home. For the next few weeks, things remain pretty placid. Gohan and Goten are able to keep the secret between them. Chi-Chi's suspicions calm down just a little bit, with Gohan coming up with the most ingenious idea, saying that, well, Goten's going to the forest because uh, he likes to learn about wild animals. Yeah, we're going on nature walks. Yeah, mom. Broly's mental capacity increases further. He and Goten are now really good friends. Gohan, that's going to take a little while since, you know, he threatened his life and all that. Broly trusts Goten enough, so when Goten asks him to remain in the forest and to stay there unless there's an emergency, Broly complies. However, Goten doesn't bank on something quite big happening. The 25th World Martial Arts Tournament. It starts off alright with everyone preparing for the event and stuff, you know, they're thinking it's pretty cool. Goten wants to take part in the junior division, but then suddenly the news comes out that Goku's going to come down for the day and meet everyone. Goten's going to get to see his dad for the first time. Goten doesn't tell Broly though, because he knows that Broly will get all jumpy and stuff like that. So when Goku actually descends to Earth and everyone's at the arena, Broly then senses something remembering and going, Kakarot, <gasps> Kakarot. But then he remembers Goten saying to never leave the forest unless it's an emergency. But, but this is an emergency. Kakarot's here. This is really important. Broly chooses to break Goten's promise and actually leave the forest to head off in search of Kakarot. It's going to take a while for Broly to actually get to the arena, so the tournament occurs as it would do in the original story. Goten's so wrapped up in his fight with Trunks and all that and all those escapades, he doesn't sense Broly approaching at all. However, since Gohan's not really doing much right now, he can sense Broly approaching. But before he can actually pull Goten aside and actually tell him that, why is Broly coming here? Spopovich then encounters Videl, and that whole thing happens. Yay! Everyone is distracted, especially Gohan. So more and more of the events that happen at the tournament occur. So we get Spopovich and Yamu draining Gohan and all that. Shin making himself known, the gang having to head off to Barbady. And this is the moment when Broly's about to actually head down into the arena area itself. He then spots several key trails heading upwards and away from the arena. They're all heading off to Barbady's spaceship. So Broly just thinks, well, that's where they're going. <gasps> and Kakarot's with them. Now Goku can sense something weird approaching from behind them. But they have to remain focused because Shin's trying to tell them stuff that's important to the mission. Oh, sorry, I just, there's a thing back there. There's no time for that, Goku. Listen. As the gang lands a safe distance away from Babidi and Dabura, Broly then lands a further distance away, witnessing the event. He's trying to figure out when the best time is to actually talk to Kakarot. They all witness the moment when Babidi collects the energy and then blows up Spopovich and Yamu as a result. Broly's really, really excited now. He can feel the energy just pumping up inside of him. He's getting more and more impatient. He doesn't like to wait. He wants Babaji to stop his jabbering, all of this hyperbole. He's getting really bored of this. He's getting angry. Eventually, Broly has had enough. He powers up into Super Saiyan form and immediately charges at Debora and Babaji, just shouting, Kakarot! Goku immediately recognizes that voice and is going like, Br Broly? What? What the? As Gohan tries to fill in the gang about the situation, Debora immediately tries to counter Broly. But for those of you who actually saw the movie, you might remember that Broly's Super Saiyan power could easily outclass Super Saiyan 2 Gohan. And since Super Saiyan 2 Gohan could hold his own against Broly, then Broly is going to pound Debora. After a brief encounter, Debora is gone and Broly squares up against Barbody. You, little potato head man, you talk too much. He fires a huge Omega Blaster, which not only takes out Barbody and the energy container, but a good portion of the vessel that lies underground. Everybody is stunned. What just happened? Well, Broly basically just 
stop the Boo Saga from happening. He's just standing in front of the Z Fighters, wiped out the whole thing, the ship's gone, Boo's egg's been vaporized, and they're completely in disbelief. But thanks to all the general healing and the sensor beans that Broly has consumed over the last few weeks, he's actually managed to regain some of his mental faculties, including the ability to speak and not just say the word Kakarot. And he can actually control his power to some degree. I mean, a bit more than he could before. But that doesn't stop Vegeta sending a punch in his direction. You think that Goku would protest this, saying, No, don't do it! He didn't do anything! But Goku kind of just lets him do it. All the while, Vegeta is congratulating himself because he's got a punch on Broly's cheek and he's thinking, Ha! I showed him! But Broly does not react to this and screams angrily because, yeah, he may be a bit more placid and elusive than he was before, but dang man, that punch hurt! He immediately powers up and is about to retaliate against Vegeta when Goten and Trunks, having finally sensed Broly's power after the whole Mighty Mask incident never happening, come to try and calm the situation down. In fact, they get so stuck into the moment that they actually get hit by both Broly and Vegeta. Goten gets slapped by Broly and Trunks gets a whop by Vegeta. Vegeta is completely bemused as to why Trunks is there in front of him and then Broly is completely aghast that Goten looks hurt and he did it. Broly would be very, very aware of what Goten's feeling and so if Goten's hurt, then Broly is going to be going, Oh my god, little Goten, are you okay? Yeah, come on. Goten's the one that gave him a chance and kind of nursed him back to health. Vegeta then demands an explanation as to why the boys are here and why they protected Broly. It's at this point, once the kids have regained their footing, that they tell the truth. Everything. Broly arriving on Earth, him being whomped by Sheet of Ice, them finding him not being able to talk, them nursing him back to health, the whole lot. After hearing this, Goku rubs his head in kind of a sort of empathic way and nods his head semi-seriously, as in like going, Okay, that kind of makes sense. Still with a serious expression, Goku walks up to Broly and grabs Broly's face, but says nothing. The two of them are staring at each other intently. Nobody knows why Goku's doing this, but Piccolo does. He can sense what's going on. He can, remember, read minds. Goku is trying to test Broly. Broly's major reason for getting all angry is Goku. If Broly's truly changed, if he sees Kakarot right in front of his face and does nothing, then what he's saying and what the kids are saying is true. And if Broly does react and decides to fly off the handle, everyone's ready to retaliate. But nothing happens. Broly's just staring back at Goku and he just says quietly, Kakarot, I found you. Goku then asks what he means by that. Broly then looks dejected and just goes, I don't know. He doesn't remember anything else now and he's now got nothing to strive for because he's now found Kakarot and he's not providing the answers, so now what? Goten and Trunks then walk up to Goku and Broly and say that not throughout the entire time that they took care of him did he fight back against them. Gohan then steps up too and confirms that this is true because if it had happened, Gohan would have taken him out. Piccolo then whips around and is shocked that Gohan would hide this information. G Gohan? Why would you hide this from us? This isn't like you! Gohan nods and say that it's true, he would have acted like that, but he trusted the kids. They, they seem really serious about this, so he wanted to have faith in them. Broly may still not be trustworthy at this point, he's got a lot to prove, but right now, he's not an imminent threat. The next person to utter protestation is Shin, the Supreme Kai. At this point, he's just been standing there, completely shocked and horrified that Majin Buu, Babadi, Deborah, one of the high up demon gods is just gone, but he still states that despite Broly taking them out, he cannot be trusted because he was the guy that destroyed South Galaxy. That's indeed true, but Broly has no recollection of this. Gohan then asks, is there any way to bring the people that died in South Galaxy back, or maybe the entire galaxy be regenerated? Well, I mean, it depends. If a particular set of Dragon Balls were strong enough, it might be able to do it. If Dende could train in some way to increase his strength and therefore the effectiveness of the Dragon Balls, then it could happen. In the meantime though, they got to remember that Broly is still a thing, he's standing right there, they need to figure out what to do with him. And before Goku goes back to the other world, he thinks that right now, Broly is trustworthy enough to at least not have to live in the forest. And given the fact that he's not in his bulky form anymore, he should be able to blend in with the populace just fine. Broly is very thankful for this gesture, but he feels like he would be imposing and that he doesn't deserve it. He's caused so much trouble for the group that 
they shouldn't be this kind to him. But it's at this point that Vegeta stuns everybody around them and says that he will take Broly in. What? But the prince has method in his madness. He states that Broly is a Saiyan and therefore his subject. If anybody should be responsible for whipping this guy back into shape and making him a loyal Saiyan, it should be the prince. And besides, if he goes rogue, then Vegeta thinks that he'd be more than powerful enough to wipe him off the face of the planet. He could take him out in a flash. A final flash. After witnessing Vegeta's stern gaze and serious intent, Shin is not one to question this and decides to allow Broly to be under Vegeta's care. Well, I mean care, I mean, you know, care in the loosest sense of the word. He does weigh up the fact that Broly did, I mean, inadvertently take out Majin Buu, who was the greatest threat to Universe 7 in existence in countless millennia. Well, he's gone now, so that that's a good thing, right? And so this odd living situation begins. Broly takes up residence at Capture Court with Bulma warming up to him quite quickly, given the fact that when Broly's in his base form state, he's quite demure and polite and formal. He kind of reminds Bulma of future Trunks in a way. And I feel like given time and Broly's mental state healing more and more, he would actually turn out to be a rather nice guy. And the fact that people have faith in him instead of his father trying to control him and suppress his feelings given his uncontrollable power, the fact that Paragus couldn't even try without using magic, it builds confidence in the guy. Broly is becoming more and more at ease with himself, kind of like how Kale progressed in a way. It just took someone to believe in them to become a better person. But yeah, Vegeta is also rather clever in how he talks to Broly. He's not gonna talk about the whole fact that his father, the king, tried to kill Broly as a child. He doesn't want to reopen that chestnut. In time, Broly begins to learn more and more about Earth's culture and feels more at ease with himself actually going out into it. He actually has quite a lot of clothes that Future Trunks had during his time there. Bulma decided to keep them instead of giving them away because who knows, Future Trunks might come back for a visit sometime and if they're not being used, then Broly can have them. And since Present Trunks is there, Goten comes to visit too, which pleases Broly greatly. And this is at this point that Vegeta hatches another plan, another reason why Broly should be there. Broly has this legendary power that Vegeta never had. So therefore, if he could figure out how to actually attain said legendary power and actually use Broly to his own ends, then maybe Vegeta could learn this legendary power too, which could be even stronger than the Super Saiyan 2 power that he managed to learn. And therefore, he could be the true princely legendary Super Saiyan. He'd be the true legend, not this brat who got lucky by chemical chance. Vegeta can then be the strongest Saiyan. But little does he know about the whole Super Saiyan 3 power because Goku never showed that in the end because he didn't need to. <laughs> yeah, oh, Vegeta's gonna be crushed. And another reason for all of this to happen is that Goku's in the other world. He's not coming back to Earth. In his eyes, after they actually let Broly out of hiding and he's actually become quite strong, in fact, keeping up with Vegeta, there's no reason for Goku to come back. And besides, Fortune Teller Baba, they've used up that 24 hour time period and the Elder Kai hasn't been released from the Z Swords, so therefore he couldn't offer his life essence to Goku. So yeah, Goku's kind of stuck there until, well, they wish him back, but he doesn't want to come back. So yeah, Goku's not coming back guys. So with Goku deciding to stay away from the planet, it's Vegeta and Broly becoming the true bastions of Earth and protecting the world. However, Bulma doesn't take too kindly to the fact that Vegeta is using Broly to his own ends and constantly insists to Broly that he should get out into the world and explore it. You know, experience life instead of being contained and trapped and caged by people because Vegeta's basically doing what his father did. And Broly takes to this rather well. Despite being apprehensive and unaware and not street savvy, he does go out into the world and he does enjoy it. He appreciates a nice walk around the parks and streets of West City every now and again. Now that he's walking around sporting Capsule Corp branded clothing, he just feels like another guy. He's just like everyone else. He can just blend in. He doesn't stand out anymore. He belongs somewhere. And where am I going with this, you're saying? I'm taking the Android 16 route. 16 was a big guy who felt like a misfit because he wasn't programmed properly. He felt like an outcast. He wasn't a full android, but he wasn't a full human. He was somewhere in between. He, like Broly now, had a clean slate in order to try and appreciate and figure out stuff on their own. Had Android 16 actually survived the Cell games and not been killed by Cell, I feel like he would have gone off into the world and become a zoologist and discovered all of nature. 
He had just gone off to his own devices and discovered every single bird that there is out there. Broly is Android 16 here. He now has a planet in order to call home. Something deep down in his mind welcomes this feeling. There was that disconnect between living and actually living that was there, but it's not anymore. He's got somewhere where he can just truly live. They don't have to hide anymore. He doesn't have to hide anymore. He can truly live. And I think that's where we'll leave things for now. This has basically been an establishing part going forward into Dragon Ball Super Part 3. Simply put, because of Broly's intervention, the Buu saga never happened. Other things to take stock in is that Goku's still in the other world and Gohan never discovered his ultimate power. Also, Vegeta never went through his margin stage, his final atonement and capping off his character arc, so he's still got a little bit ways to go now, but I feel like he can actually get to it, just it takes a little longer. He also never went under the resentment that made him become Margin Vegeta, and now that Goku's not there anymore, he therefore is the strongest on the planet, which gives him some comfort and catharsis. Any ill feeling that he had is effectively gone. He feels pretty happy with his lot. He can whip around Broly, whip him into becoming a good student, and be subservient to him, and also potentially learn a new power. So it's all coming up for Vegeta. He is the top dog now. We continue the story after the Buu saga with Broly being properly integrated into life around Capture Corp, effectively becoming Trunks' bigger brother. And he's very much like an Android 16 figure in terms of stature as well as his placid nature. Yeah, because Broly is a big boy. He even managed to find an interest in martial arts. He got all of this interest, not from the prince, but from the many walks he takes around West City. He would walk around the parks and see people taking Tai Chi and wanting to really get into it, but not really having the courage to actually go up there and ask, C can Broly join in the class too? Eventually, he'd realize that Master Roshi and Krillin are very much into martial arts as well as meditation and stuff like that. I think he would very much go to Kame House and ask Master Roshi to help him learn the basics. In that manner, Broly would much become like Goku in terms of embracing martial arts into his culture and life instead of just relying to brutish tactics of just basic punches. In the four years between the end of the Boo Saga and the beginning of Super, Broly has now pretty much recovered his mind entirely on a diet of sensu beans and, you know, basic peacetime. He's even managed to find a job at Capture Corp as a courier because, you know, he can fly. He's really quick like that. I mean, that is when he isn't being trained by Vegeta. Speaking of Vegeta, sure enough, all of this training with someone who is quite strong, almost as equally as strong, has actually paid dividends for Vegeta. He is much stronger than he was at the beginning of Super in the original story. That being said, we've got to turn our attention to the Son family, because right now, they're feeling pretty dejected because, you know, Goku, when he had the chance to come back, decided to stay dead. So that's a real kick in the teeth. You know, despite all of the peril that we saw with Barbadi and Deborah thinking, hmm, even with Goku not around, there was trouble, and that was the reason why he chose to stay dead. So it wouldn't matter which way he was. Oh, none of that compelled to Goku. So he decided to go back to the afterlife and perfect his Super Saiyan 3 power in secret. But that being said, it does mean that he has been able to master the Super Saiyan 3 power, thanks to the limitless well of power in the afterlife, and he can now use it with very little stamina being used. So it's kind of like a perfected Super Saiyan 3. Apart from those things I just mentioned, things are relatively similar to what they are in Super, right up to the point when Beerus arrives on Earth and actually wakes up, trying to find the Super Saiyan God. As can be expected, Beerus can pretty much go wherever he wants in Universe 7, so he ends up going to King Kai's world and finding Goku through the prophecy and all that, like in the original, so that doesn't change. He is able to find Goku as the potential Saiyan candidate that might be the Super Saiyan God that he dreamt about just a few minutes ago. Despite being stronger now than he was in the original story, Goku is still no match for Beerus. Yeah, he was able to be defeated in two punches, let's just say maybe, uh, four? He's still whomped by the kitty cat who then goes off to find more Saiyans on Earth. And this is when Goku realizes that, yeah, I better go back to Earth. So he has to try and hatch a plan to get back there using the rules that are supplied to him. Things cannot be good if Beerus is after Saiyans and Goku wasn't able to take him down. On the matter of Earth, Beerus arrives on the same day as Bulma's birthday party, like in the original story. He does the usual thing of degrading Vegeta, telling him he's useless, Vegeta being scared, and then Bulma finding them all and asking Beerus to take part in the festivities because it involves food. So, of course, the kitty cat's not going to say no. The only thing I'm going to be destroying today is the buffet selection. Come along, Whis. 
Broly then spots Beerus, but he doesn't put two and two together. Had he not received amnesia and he still turned good, he might have been aware of Beerus thanks to all of the things that Paragus might have been mentioning. Paragus might have been aware of Beerus because he was part of King Vegeta's court. Everyone would know about Beerus. But since Broly doesn't remember everything, when he sees Beerus, he doesn't really twig that this was basically the guy who doomed planet Vegeta. That nugget of information is lost to him, unfortunately. One big thing in Goku's favor, though, is that there is no Majin Buu to spoil the party. Without the big pink blob, Beerus is able to get his fill on pudding entirely. Thusly, his time spent at Bulma's birthday party before Goku arrives to try and save the day is pretty amiable and he gets on with everyone because, you know, he's getting food and he loves the food. In fact, the food is so good that he forgets about the Super Saiyan God entirely. That is until said Saiyan that he fought earlier arrives to try and get his revenge. Wait, 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 Masako. How exactly did he do this? Well... It's all down to thanks to the heavenly world of Dragon Ball, what they love, technicalities. Since Goku went home a little earlier back in the Buu saga, he hadn't used all of his 24 hours up, so he went to Fortune Teller Barber, who then agreed to take him back for a few hours so he could save the day. And then when they realized that Beerus was about to destroy the only planet that had beings that could protect Universe 7 from the likes of evildoers, then, you know, this was a high priority. King Yama just fast-tracked that one. The Saiyan is extremely perplexed as to why the God of Destruction hadn't destroyed Earth yet or hadn't taken anyone on yet, but everyone else is even more mystified as to why Goku just suddenly showed up. He hadn't been planning an announcement or anything or coming. They thought he was basically dead until they wished him back with the Dragon Balls, which was never. Goku shouts out to Beerus that he isn't done yet with the fighting that they had, and he's ready for round two. Vegeta then runs up to Goku and just tries to get him to calm down, trying to say that Beerus isn't here to do anything bad. But all of this is distracting Beerus from food, thus making him agitated. Meanwhile, Broly is very conflicted in terms of emotions. He's extremely happy to see Kakarot again, but at the same time, he's confused as to why Vegeta is being so cautious, because he's never cautious. So, yeah, Broly is very, very perplexed and puzzled and all the other hyperboles that denote confusion. Beerus is getting extremely annoyed with Vegeta and Goku bickering, so he slaps the pair of them trying to knock some sense into each other because he's getting very, very frustrated and oops, he better not have done that. This angers Broly. And we all know what happens when Broly gets angry. He shouts, Kakarot! And goes big. And after all of the training that he's done with Vegeta, he's able to control this legendary power better than ever. But right now, two of his friends are in trouble, so he must do something. Broly lets out a massive mighty roar that catches Beerus' attention for a nanosecond. Then when Whis is looking up from all the food that he's eating, he recognizes Broly, the big legendary beast, and goes like, Hmm, isn't that the being that tried to destroy South Galaxy all those years ago? Huh. Neat and then goes back to his food. Broly's power is now maximum once more, and he then launches an attack on Beerus which actually connects quite effectively. It then sends Beerus spiraling into the air before Broly unleashes an Omega Blaster right in Beerus's direction. It envelops Beerus, singeing his clothing, but otherwise leaving the God of Destruction relatively unscathed. This gets Beerus thinking. Hmm, I see this power. Might this Saiyan be the actual Super Saiyan God and not that little time waster over there? The cat powers up a little to see whether his theory is right and engages in much more combat, using about, you know, 10% of his power. Oh dear. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, Broly, Broly goes down like them. Oh well, false alarm. You see, the thing with God Key being untraceable, Broly couldn't get a handle on the being's power, so he just went in hell for leather, was reckless, and therefore, you know, he was done for. He's been used to fighting Vegeta, who has key, and then fighting someone who doesn't. Yeah. As that fight's been going on, Goku and Vegeta are trying to figure out what on earth they're going to do. Pure strength isn't going to be able to win this battle, so they're trying to think, well, he's going on about Super Saiyan gods, they don't really know anything about them, who might know? Um, Shenron? To do so, Vegeta gets in the way of the fight of Beerus and Broly, and says to Beerus that they might be able to find the Super Saiyan god after all. Since Beerus was mildly entertained by this big brute fighting him, as well as seeing Vegeta groveling much like his father, he is more willing to actually comply with this request because, you know, he's not as angry as he was in the Battle of Gods movie and arc. Everyone wishes on the dragon and they find out about the Super Saiyan God ritual. They need six Saiyans in order to enact it, and luckily for them this time, they do have six Saiyans, and thusly Videl's pregnancy remains a secret. 
well, a secret to everyone except Dende. The ritual goes off without a hitch because Broly's heart is purified over the years of recovery. Goku then becomes a Super Saiyan God, has his fight with Beerus, but it does yield better results than in the original. This is all thanks to Goku's much more intense and less interrupted training whilst he was in the afterlife. It means that Beerus has to use more of his power to actually fend off Goku in the Super Saiyan God form. Even when the Saiyan falls down to Super Saiyan, he still has to use more power. The fighter is actually a challenge for Beerus, and he has to use about 80% of his power instead of the allotted 70, as was actually sourced in the original. This leaves Beerus even more passionate than he was before. This mortal, who's only just discovered God Key, could actually give him a run for his money? Him! A god of destruction, perfecting his craft over hundreds of thousands of years, and then this guy just comes along and almost beats him. And had that other being become the Super Saiyan God, then he might have been able to actually beat Beerus, and he can't be having that. He's got to make sure that these guys are on his side. Having a mortal best of god of destruction, it'd be total anarchy. So in that regard, the cat got extremely lucky. He calls a halt to the proceedings and says to them all that he's not done with them yet, and once he returns, he will figure out what he's going to do with them. And with that, Whis whisks him away, take out in hand, and everyone collapses to the ground, tired as hell. Once everyone's been able to recover a little bit, Broly looks to Kakarot and asks him the big question. Are you going to be coming back to us, Kakarot? Goku looks to everyone, and then up to the sky where Beerus had just been. He nods and says, Yeah, I'm coming back. And this is only because there is a bigger challenge in the real world other than the afterlife, so he thinks that he can come back. It's time to gather the Namekian Dragon Balls, and that's where we're going to leave things right now. With Broly's inclusion in the story, Beerus' introduction into the group is much more cordial and less disruptive than it was with Majin Buu there, because, you know, pudding. Plus, it means that everyone in the Saiyan party becomes stronger, including Goku. All of this extra muscle is rubbed off on everyone else, I think, too, so that's kind of cool. We continue the story right after we did in the last part, with Whis and Beerus heading home, discussing the events of what transpired when Beerus slightly wakes up because of all the buffeting going through at the speed of light throughout the galaxy. While they're talking, we then actually remember something that went down not that long ago. Maybe just like a few years ago? But, well, I mean, a few's a relative with a god and an angel. But they remembered that South Galaxy was just not there anymore. And it was very, very odd that that would just suddenly disappear and Beerus had nothing to do with it. There was talk going around that it was a Saiyan that actually did the deed. So when Beerus finds out that all of this destruction came from one mortal, He's even more interested to get these Saiyans here. But, you know, he's obviously got to play coy. You know, he's got a, you know, he's got a reputation to keep up. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Goku and Broly are catching up after lost time. And Goku is absolutely mesmerized with how strong Broly's become in the intermediate time. But at the same time, Vegeta's is kind of resentful that this punk just showed up and kind of just made him the third strongest Saiyan here. But at the same time, Vegeta's are kind of grateful that Earth wasn't destroyed and that Beerus suddenly disappeared and is no longer a threat, at least for the time being. Nevertheless, Goku is determined to help make Broly fix what he did before he actually became a good boy, and that is to bring back South Galaxy. Why am I talking about this here? Well, I think that Broly now needs a new goal, not just to get stronger or to control his power, but to right the wrongs that Paragus kind of almost instilled in him, and that is to revive South Galaxy back to the way it was, you know, before the Cell Games. They know that the Earth Dragon Balls can't bring back a whole galaxy, but the Namekian Dragon Balls might be able to do that. So Goku and Broly head off together via instant transmission to try and ask the Namekians whether it's even possible. Purunga is then summoned, and Goku makes the wish that he wishes for South Galaxy to be restored along with its people. But sure enough, Purunga then says, that is beyond my power. And that comes as a shock, because at this point in the story, Peronga has never denied a wish based on the fact that it was beyond his power. Shenron does that all the time, it's become a bit of a meme. But for Peronga, the only reasons that wishes haven't worked with him is because either people didn't need the wish, or Goku was just like, No, I'm good. No, I'm good. Goku and Broly are left disappointed, with the latter being particularly bummed out. He thought he'd be able to atone for his sins back when he was just considered a monster and was completely uncontrollable. Or Paragus at least didn't try and stop him. When Poronga asks if they have any other wishes that they might be able to consider, Goku then actually uses this point to ponder for a moment. There might be something after all. He then asks Poronga whether it would be possible to transport the both of them to where Beerus and Whis are located. Beerus is pad. Poronga, like Shenron, is kind of nervous at this proposition. 
Why would two mortals want to go and actually disturb the destroyer god of all things? It's basically something he could do, but why would he have to do it? The Namekians are absolutely stunned at what they're hearing, and Purunga is just like going, uh, he doesn't want to hear anymore. Yeah, fine, whatever, you go and do it. I'm, I'm just going to leave now. He doesn't want to be sticking around and having Beerus come to him saying, Hey you dragon, were you actually responsible for disturbing my slumber? Looks like I might have to destroy you. Yeah, Purunga's going like, oh, Purunga out. Now Goku needed this wish because at this point in the story, he cannot sense divine key. So he wouldn't be able to use instant transmission in the typical way. He's going to need a bit of a help. Whis is cordial and Beerus is happy to see them, but he's got to keep up appearances. So he is uh, irritated that they dare actually come to the world of a destroyer god unannounced and uninvited of all things. Yeah. Goku is completely unfazed. His eyes are on the prize. So he actually says, Oh yeah, I'll be able to give you a free supply of earth food for the rest of your life, just so on the condition that Broly and I could train with Whis and you. Beerus ponders for a moment, making this seem like it's the biggest decision of his life, but on the inside, he's elated. He didn't even have to go back to Earth to ask them. They came to him. Oh, so convenient. He can sleep for a little bit longer. Whis will come for them when he's ready. Just as long as they've got some food ready to go when he gets there, everything should be fine. Goku and Broly are indeed excited, but Broly feels a little bit guilty about all of this for a sudden. He then asks Whis two questions. First, whether Vegeta would be able to come and join them because, yeah, as Saiyans, they want to bond and make sure everybody's strong. And not to mention for the fact that Vegeta and Broly did train a lot. If Broly went behind Vegeta, it would be really unfair. And secondly, is there any possible way that South Galaxy could be restored? And Whis is just going, oh, that's easy. We can use the Super Dragon Balls. Yeah, I think because of all of this and Broly asking, the revelation of the Super Dragon Balls comes slightly earlier than it does in the original story. But at this point, these aren't your average sized balls. They are planet sized and there is no meaningful way of being able to track them at this point. Bulma hasn't made the radar yet. Whis will look into it after Earth food is given to him. It's a very big, important negotiating chip. With that, the two Saiyans then head home and prepare for training, with Vegeta being told about this and included, and he is jumping on the opportunity. Months pass, and Gohan and Videl give birth to Pan, and Goku, Broly, and Vegeta are well into their training with Whis. Like in the original, Freezer is brought back to life thanks to Sorbet and Taguma, and they are ready to bear down on Earth with Frieza wanting to get revenge on Goku and completely unaware of the inclusion of Broly in the proceedings. The Thousand Soldier battle takes place like it does in the original with Gohan leading the charge right up to the point where he reaches his lowest ebb in the story, at least narratively speaking. With the unleashing of his power, this sends a message to the three Saiyans on Beerus' planet that it's time for them to come home and face up against Frieza. Sure, Frieza is surprised to see Vegeta and Goku here all of a sudden, but Who's this other punk and monkey? He's completely unaware of Broly's existence. Broly, having been told about what Freezer's like, is aware that he needs to actually big himself up. He states that he is the legendary Super Saiyan, the one who destroyed South Galaxy, even though it's a bitter pill to swallow. He's not exactly proud of it, but he's got to make it seem like he is. It doesn't exactly work on Freezer, but it does work on Sorbet. Between the time that Frieza was off around the Future Trunks saga to where he is right now, Sorbet and the rest of the Frieza forces, or what was left of them, was scattered about, and they would have heard about South Galaxy suddenly disappearing, and it had something to do with the legendary Super Saiyan, or some kind of big entity. So Sorbet would be well aware that if this is the guy who took out a whole galaxy, oh dear, this makes Sorbet absolutely petrified. He is then going to Frieza. Oh, Lord Frieza, you better not mess with him. He, he is the legendary super he, 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 he's, oh, 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 ga galaxy gone. Ah, ah. At this point in the story, he's basically Resurrection F Frieza, very one dimensional and very ruthless. He's not the Frieza that we currently know from the Broly movie and in Super. Frieza is not going to take this insubordination. And despite the plan that Sorbe and Frieza have, Frieza is not going to hear any more words about a monkey destroying a galaxy. He takes out Sorbet with a hit. And I think Frieza would do that because at this point he would not want to hear anyone challenging his opinion. Goku then decides to take Frieza on first and showcases the power of Super Saiyan Blue, with Frieza retorting with the power of Golden Frieza. Goku is determined to end this fight quickly because he knows that Frieza will stop at nothing to try and get revenge on him and destroy his homeworld of Earth. 
With Frieza's plan gone, with Sorbet trying to take Goku out surreptitiously, Goku is able to take Frieza down to his final form again, and Frieza is completely on the ropes. It's basically instead of Vegeta and Frieza, it's Goku and Frieza. Goku's about to do the deed, Frieza then does his deed, and takes out Earth instantly, with Whis only being able to take everyone else in the vicinity away from the planet, and leaving Goku and Frieza completely gone and decimated. This affects everyone, especially Broly. He's lost his master again! He cannot cope with this happening, and he is absolutely devastated, flickering with the legendary power again. But we slowly soothe the beast down after having months of training and knowing what he's about to do. He says, it's okay Broly, we've got this, I am able to reverse time. Vegeta is absolutely relieved because he didn't want to face a legendary Super Saiyan Broly again. So they go back and Broly and Vegeta know exactly what to do. Vegeta and Broly team up and fire a blast telling Goku to get out of the way, and he doesn't need telling twice. They jointly show off the power of Super Saiyan Blue, with Broly having a slightly tinted variant, and show the power to Frieza, vaporizing him almost at once. Goku is absolutely surprised to see this happen, and is kind of disappointed that he didn't get to finish Frieza off again, but Vegeta is having none of it because Goku got to do it once, so it was about time that Vegeta did it, and he's completely unaware that Broly helped. As far as he's concerned, Vegeta is the one that took out Frieza, and I think this would be very good for his character, and ultimately from Resurrection F, it was totally deserved for Vegeta to get the win. So here, Vegeta gets the win. Sure, he did get some help from the punk, but he was able to get one over Kakarot, and that's what matters. Either way, Goku's not particularly fussed about it, and he's just more focused on how Broly was able to use the power of Super Saiyan Blue so efficiently. But frankly, Broly's just happy to see Kakarot alive again, and goes in and gives him a big bear hug while still in Super Saiyan Blue and Goku's in base form, so Goku has to power up to Blue again just to make sure he's not crushed. Now about those Super Dragon Balls, Broly states that Whis hasn't gotten around to actually finding them yet, and with the whole thing about Freeze, it kind of put it out to their minds. And Goku agrees that now Freeze is gone for good this time, they should now focus on finding the Super Dragon Balls so they can bring back South Galaxy. Whis then remembers this request and chuckles awkwardly that he did go trying finding them, but he wasn't able to actually locate them. They weren't where they were originally based. This is when Beerus curses, saying that, Oh, that blasted Champa took them! I bet he's going to wish on something selfish! This leaves the Saiyans nonplus because they were unaware that Beerus had a brother, and I think this is a good point to leave things for right now. So there we go, with Sorbet taken out of the picture by very stubborn and arrogant Lord Freezer, Goku was able to get the win over Freezer for the longest point, he wasn't bested by a laser beam, and we got Vegeta and Broly taking out Freezer. In any case, Broly did play his part in this story by instilling fear in Sorbet, which ultimately meant that Goku was no longer harmed and he could do his thing. Despite the fact that Broly didn't do much fighting, he did help Vegeta though. And I think this was a really good way of trying to really call back the fact that Vegeta was the one to help Broly train and focus his power. We're going to be heading into Universe 6 with Broly determined to find the Super Dragon Ball, so what is he going to do exactly? When the three Saiyans return to Beerus' world and train some more, after the Resurrection F arc, Shampa and Vados arrive to discuss arrangements for Shampa to take Universe 7's Earth for himself because of the food and his Earth is broken. Beerus doesn't want that, and this ultimately leads to the 5 vs 5 tournament that we traditionally see at this point in Super's story. The winner of this tournament gets a wish on the Super Dragon Balls. That's it! Broly now realises what he needs to do! He's just gotta win a tournament! Well that was easy! With 5 days to gather challenges for the tournament, Universe 7 are looking for members. Well, I mean, I, I, I say looking, they actually pretty much already have the crew that they need. You know, it's just a formality. Broly, Vegeta and Goku are already in, which leaves two spots remaining. Piccolo takes spot number four, like he does in the original, with Gohan then declining because, oh, you know, oh, I don't want to miss my conference. Conference this, conference that. All right, so much for that then. Off we go, find another thing. Ah! No, it's not that easy, Gohan. You're not getting out of this one. This whole thing actually really ticks Broly off quite a bit. When Broly first discovered Gohan, just after he had his amnesia, he viewed Gohan as a serious fighter who controlled Broly when he was a loose cannon back in the day. That's a lot of respect to have. Now in a way, the legendary Super Saiyan here had begun to view Gohan as a bigger brother of, of sorts, sort of aping how Goten saw him. Now to see him reject this opportunity and reject all the values that he understood Gohan to have, all the while promising to improve after what happened recently, 
This is really galling for Broly. This is him welching on that promise. How dare he? At first, it's pretty calm. Broly steps forward and pleads with Gohan to reconsider. But Gohan is insistent that, oh no, I have to be at the conference. But Broly isn't listening. This is making him angry. This is something that Vegeta has been seeing more and more of lately. And this is beginning to worry the prince. Broly losing his temper. It seems that with all of this new power coursing through his veins, the God Key, having more and more of it overflowing, it has been giving the young man a lot of trouble. The only way that Vegeta has been able to control this is to train him harder to manage it all. Not having to use magical collars or amulets, no, just straight up training. Unfortunately, but also fortunately, they have been getting extra training from Whis, and now they've been getting stronger and stronger at a much faster rate, with a key that Vegeta is relatively new to. And so therefore, things are getting a little bit out of whack. Broly is losing more and more control, and this is what the prince fears might happen, possibly regressing back to his evil past and what they saw on that little fate with the comet Komori. Broly then launches himself at Gohan, transforming into a Super Saiyan, leaving Gohan on the back foot, having to transform himself in order to defend. What follows now is pretty frightening. Broly going slightly berserk, and Gohan desperately trying to not get himself or Broly hurt. Goku all the while is just asking, what's going on? It's almost like we're seeing the original Broly here. And Vegeta is looking really concerned. But it's also curious to see how Gohan deals with this because, after all, Vegeta did say in the original timeline at this point that Gohan had the most potential out of everyone present. If only he just decided to utilize that potential, he could have done great. So, now is the time to do so. Broly is besting Gohan at every turn, with Piccolo figuring that he probably should step in, but Vegeta does so first. That's enough, Broly! Cease! Broly stops and powers down. In all of this training, the one person he had come to take orders from always was Vegeta. He collapses to the ground and catches his breath. He then apologizes to Gohan and remains quiet for the rest of the time there. Vegeta then turns to Gohan and rolls with what just happened, as if it was meant to happen. You see, Gohan, you have potential to handle the legendary Super Saiyan in battle. Why would you wish to squander such a talent as this? But I already told you, Vegeta. I have a job and a family to support. I support? Kid, you are the son-in-law to the richest martial artist in the world. You live in a mansion with a staff and everything taken care of for you. Believe me, I know what it's like, sort of. You are hardly in a state of squalor like Kakarot. Wait, what? The point is, Gohan, you want to support your family, really support them, you sign up for this team, because if you don't, this world may cease to exist as you know it, and then there will be nothing left for you to support. Now this is what gets Gohan's attention. It's true. He did wish to get stronger to protect his family. It just took the right person to try and convince him. After some soul searching, he then agrees to take part in the tournament. Now, okay, well, why does he do this, Masako? Well, you see, it was a two-pronged approach. First off, Broly's resentment for Gohan's disinclination to fight was one reason to take part, but at the same time, Vegeta needed to keep Broly under control and in good standing with everyone else because otherwise it would all fall apart. Making this out to be some kind of plan was the only way for everybody to still trust Broly and not let on that Vegeta has been beginning to struggle with the Saiyan ever since them both acquiring the Super Saiyan Blue Power and therefore God Key. God Key had not mixed well with Broly's mind. Now with Gohan in tow, Piccolo and Gohan continue with their training with the other three Saiyans retiring to the Room of Spirit and Time for the remaining three days that they have, all before the tournament takes place. Now inside the room, Vegeta focuses on strengthening Broly's composure in the blue form, and it seemingly goes very well. The team then gather, Gohan in tow, for the tournament on the nameless planet where Universe 6 is ready to go also. On the way, Gohan and Broly reconcile, and the former actually goes out of his way to say thank you. Thank me? Why? You gave me a kick up the backside, Broly. I needed to figure out what my priorities were, and they're for my family. I mean, if I can't protect them the way I know best, then what good am I? I need to do this to remind myself of how lucky I am to have this life. Broly doesn't know what to say to this, but a simple nod does the job. As for the entrance exam, all of the Universe 17 pass without too many issues. Goku and Broly scrape by, with Gohan understandably getting the highest score out of everybody, which then impresses both Whis and Vardos. Vardos going, 
would you look at this, brother? A saiyan with brains to match their brawn. <laughs> I never thought I'd see the day coming from Universe 7 of all things. <laughs> Understandably, Whis doesn't take this too kindly, but he's classy enough to not retort. At least not yet. The tournament then begins with the order and matches all the way up to Vegeta and Hit playing out the same way as they do before. Goku, Piccolo and Vegeta successfully blitz their way through Batamo, Frost, despite his cheating, Magetta, as well as Kaba with little stress. I mean, except for Magetta's sweating out stint, of course. Kaba, though, with his interaction with Vegeta, reminds the prince of his relationship with Broly, and thusly, he does treat Kaba with less bluntness than he does in the original. Recognising, therefore, the young boy's plucky attitude, like Broly had at the beginning, and the willingness to learn. This is just like Broly was, but without the risk of going berserk ever playing out in his mind. Kaba, he's a calm boy. We then get to the fight between Hit and Vegeta. And as expected, it goes pretty much the same way as it did before, with Vegeta not being able to anticipate Hit's time skip ability. Oh, the days when the time skip ability was genuinely unbeatable. I miss those times. With Vegeta out for the count, Broly is next up to try and figure against the seemingly unstoppable man of Hit. At first, Broly is trying to figure out his actions, much like how Kakarot would, but it's not going much better than when Vegeta tried to do so, and it's getting Broly a little frustrated. He tries again and again to outwit Hit, but it's no good. Hit is always one tenth ahead of him, and whatever Broly tries to do, meets with nothing. Broly's mind is too transfixed on his movements, much like his master, and it's causing him to play out his movements like a book. But there's one thing Hit didn't count on and something Vegeta didn't have, and that was Broly's explosive temper. With each miss and each strike on him, Broly is losing his cool. The Super Saiyan Blue power may be easier to control than before for him, but Broly has rarely been bested by anyone since joining the Z Fighters. I mean, think about it. When was the last time that Broly lost? I mean, apart from Beerus. This is the first time that he's truly been put on the ropes, and he does not like it. Fighting Beerus, he was in a form that he was used to, you know, with the berserk legendary Super Saiyan power, that was fine. But now with God Key, it's harder. And when Hit dodges him one more time, Broly snaps. Broly lets out a scream and the arena starts to shake. His eyes white out and he bulks up something major like he did back in the day. Vegeta is shocked and scared. Oh no. Broly's blue hair grows outwards more and more, getting spikier and spikier. His pupils gone and a look of mania across his face. Hit doesn't know what's going on, but he will soon enough. Things aren't looking good for Broly, but what is looking good is the deal from today's sponsor. NordVPN. This service is something I hugely rely on in regards to my privacy online, especially since I'm now going traveling around the UK and America for the next couple of months. Also, if you're going to Anime Expo this year in LA, I'm going to be there with the TFS crew. I need to be protected, and Nord's got my back, thankfully, by offering me thousands of servers in Europe, Asia, America, and Africa to shield my personal information. These servers from over 60 countries keep me safe thanks to the inclusion of military-grade encryption technology and an easy-to-use interface that looks just about as good as the new Broly movie did, am I right? NordVPN's crowning feature is that you don't need to be an expert in internet security to use it. Within a couple of seconds and a couple of taps, you're good to go. And if you go to nordvpn.com slash Marsico, you're able to get a three year plan. That's right, three years, you heard me right, for just $2.99 a month. And on top of that, if you then enter the code Marsico as well at checkout, you get a bonus month of use for free. So give NordVPN a go by visiting nordvpn.com slash Marsico and use the code Marsico for that free month and ready yourself for a summer of fun safe from snooping eyes. But all eyes today are on Broly and his mind. Beerus and Whis are witnessing Broly becoming more and more erratic, and Beerus isn't liking what he is seeing. Saiyans, what is going on with your lackey? Don't tell me I bought a pup of a fighter I backed the wrong horse or whatever kind of hyperboles that you earthlings say. Goku isn't sure what's going on either. Broly seemed just fine a second ago, but Vegeta has an idea about what might be happening and he isn't sure whether he should share it with the group right now. Broly's mind is being torn apart by the frustration of not getting his way. And it kind of makes sense. Up until now, Broly had been relatively more powerful than any villain that they'd come across with him there as part of the team, which upon reflection, wasn't that many villains. Boo, Boo was ice before he had the chance to escape the sealed ball, remember that? You know, Broly just 
pointed his hand at Barbadi and Deborah and they were blown away in an instant. <laughs> the boo saga didn't even happen. And Frieza, when he came back, he was taken out as part of a double act with his master. So they were able to succeed. They got what they wanted. Now I know what you're thinking. Beerus bested him in the previous part, so yeah, you know, Broly's been defeated before, but that was really comprehensive. Broly had been beat without even processing what had happened, so he couldn't even get frustrated, he didn't have the time. With Hit though, this is the first time since Broly came to Earth, or indeed actually ever, even before he lost his memory, that he'd fought someone who was nearly on his level and yet he couldn't phase. It was beginning to get to him, and his mind was also beginning to melt. Now Vegeta's own mind is firing on all cylinders. What does he do? Does he interfere and risk the disqualification of Universe 7 for trying to interfere and interrupt a battle? Or does he wait it out and just see what Hit tries to do? After a tense few moments, Beerus and Vegeta are looking at each other and back to Broly with a look of nervous tension across both of their faces. However, Broly, he's beginning to tire but not before he lets out the ultimate example of frustration, a scream which shakes the planet. He then lets out a huge mouth beam of green energy, like you tend to see in the Broly movie and in the original movies, which shoots up into the sky and shatters the sphere that protects the arena from the harsh environment outside. And with Vados and Whis quick to repair it though. That is something that Goku and Vegeta have seen before. Uh oh. You know, key overflowing. But Hit has seen enough. With a blue aura, he improves his skills and knocks Broly out cold. Universe 7's Broly has been KO'd! The winner of this contest is Hit of Universe 6! Vegeta collapses to the ground, absolutely exhausted and terrified. They had gotten very lucky. Broly's body is on the floor of the arena and covered in bruises from all of the times that Hit had gotten him. Goku and Vegeta then gather around Broly, heading on down to the arena and helping him up and then back to the Universe 7 area to then kind of recover and regain consciousness. When Broly comes to, he spots Vegeta and apologizes for his behavior. But when Goku tries to talk to him, Broly doesn't say anything. He just looks at Goku's hand and doesn't do anything. You know, not at all. It just kind of just stays there. But then Broly gets up and walks over to the other side of the green area away from everybody else, blanking Goku in particular. What was that about, Vegeta? Uh, uh, I don't know, Kakarot. Go bother someone else. It's your turn next anyway. Oh yeah, cool. See you when it's over, Jeet. He goes back to the arena, getting ready for, indeed, his match with Hit. But this time, Hit starts off the fight by actually talking. Talking to Goku, unlike in the original, saying, a word of warning before we begin our match. Oh, well, you talk? Cool. I didn't think you were the talking type. So, yeah, what's the warning about? Oh, 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 don't tell me. Are you gonna warn me about your strength that you're the strongest being there ever was? Cause, you know, don't bother. I don't need a warning. Your friend is in great danger. I know what he is. He is the being that destroyed your South Galaxy. Wh what? How do you know that? I have lived over a thousand years. I have seen many things, heard many things. Words of a whole galaxy disappearing in a matter of seconds? It's not something that you hear every day. That monster is not to be trusted. Goku is now looking a little nervous, but more serious when he responds. I don't know where you got your facts from, but you're wrong. Broly isn't like that anymore. He's changed. He's on our side. Are you sure about that? Look to me that he was one scream away from blowing this planet to Kingdom Come and everyone with it. If I hadn't stopped him, who knows what may have happened. Be careful, Saiyan. Now, shall we get this over with? Hit gets into his stance, and the match begins with Goku even more determined than before to win. Broly watches the match play out from a distance, and it goes like it does in the original, with Goku and Hit going all out, getting Kaioken times 10, and then Beerus and Shampa bickering to the point where basically Hit grows tired of all of this and just forfeits the match out of sheer contempt. Now remember, there is no Monarcha here because we got a full team. Since Goku got the win and won the tournament for Universe 7, it means that that team gets the chance to make a wish on the Super Dragon Balls. That is until after Zeno comes down and does his thing with everybody spooking the heck out of everyone and then being inspired to do the Tournament of Power after meeting Goku. But more on that later. Once Goku recovers enough to walk, he walks over to Broly and pats his shoulder to which the other Saiyan recoils and looks angry. Whoa Broly, calm down! I know it's been real tense up to now, but we won! 
That means we can wish for South Galaxy to be restored. Isn't that what you always wanted? South Galaxy. Yes. That's what Broly want. Uh, you okay there, buddy? You seem a little off. No. Broly is fine. Let's go wish Galaxy back. It's been ages since Broly talked that way. Just, what did Hit do to him? The time has then come for the wish to be made, with Whis and Beerus ready to make the wish indeed, and Vegeta orders Broly to request his wish. Broly wish for South Galaxy back. Whis looks a little puzzled. You mean you wish for it to be restored? Yeah, that. Very well. And then Whis makes the wish to Super Shenron in the traditional godly manner, which is basically Japanese backwards if you weren't curious, and with also pretty peas and carrots. The wish is made, and as if by magic, South Galaxy has been magically restored to its former self before Broly had evaporated it. And immediately, King Kai consents that the South Kai is over the moon with his home back and ready to go back to it, and that they kept his word. Oh, King Kai, oh, this is marvelous! Be sure to tell that Broly boy that all is forgiven. Ah, uh, yeah, about that. You might want to keep the receipt on your galaxy, dude. What? I don't know what's up exactly. But that boy might be heading down a slippery slope. I just hope my own boys can do something about it before that happens. Back on Earth, Vegeta has begun to breathe a little more easily now that they've had a chance to recover and just chill out for a little bit. Back to their routine of training and whatnot. Broly's mind has actually since calmed down a little bit since coming back to Capture Corp, and also his speech has returned to normal. He was even more willing to engage in conversation with Goku again, something which the Saiyan was very glad to witness. When Broly is having a break and playing with Trunks and Goten, Goku and Vegeta are then having a conversation. Something that doesn't often happen, which makes Goku think that whatever Vegeta wants to talk to him about, it must be something serious. I didn't want to talk about this in front of Broly, but I think we may be in trouble. There's something about that Super Saiyan Blue power and his fight with that purple man that set him off for some reason. That power isn't mixing well with his natural power. Even when he's fine, his hair is a different shade to ours. Can't you see it? Something isn't right. He's like a time bomb ready to explode. Okay, so what do we do? Do we just bump him on the noggin again and hope he forgets it all? Vegeta looks at Goku with incredulity. I'll give you a bump on the noggin in a minute, you dolt! What we do is have Broly avoid any confrontations for the time being. Better yet, find those Dragon Balls and wish for Broly's mind to be manipulated so that he never remembers his past. If he remembers what you mean to him, it could spell doom for us all. We might be seeing more than South Galaxy disappear soon. Goku looks intense at him, and then Broly, who is casually drinking a fizzy drink as if nothing bad has happened at all. They really don't want to have to deal with him again at full strength. Sure, they have beer and Whis to help this time, but there is no guarantee that they will indeed help and take their side. They may be on their own. And so, for the next couple of months, Goku and Vegeta do what they can to make sure that Broly's life is as calming as possible. Even with the Potofu arc, they manage to distract Broly by asking Bulma to ask him to help out with chores and carrying important rocket parts around for the engineer. You know, just help out around the factory. And the workers are looking pretty astounded that this one guy is able to carry around hundreds and hundreds of tons of equipment like it was just the bag of groceries or something. But Dr. Bulma, we, we've got the latest technology and transportation craft to do that. We've got the cars to do the job. Well, what are you doing? <laughs> but those cost money, retorts Bulma. If I could save a few hundred zennies worth of fuel, <laughs> I'll take that opportunity, thank you. And so, we then come to the beginning of the Goku Black arc. As we know, Future Trunks escapes to the past after his future timeline has been cut to pieces. And when he comes to, with his past mother in front of him, he then spots Goku and mistakes him for Goku Black, but that misunderstanding pales in comparison when Trunks then spots Broly. And now, he's really on the defensive. Broly recognizes this boy, but, but from where? Then it begins to click. Something in the back of his mind has told his waking mind that he has met this guy before and it wasn't on good terms. Broly starts to get angry. The feelings that his brains are fueling him with, they're not happy feelings. This guy did bad stuff to him and Vegeta's plan to keep Broly calm has failed. Broly's rage and anger was stemming from the connection that his brain was making with this person that had just come from the future, Trunks. That name was something his old life remembered well. I mean, it can't be, though. Trunks is the young boy that he considered one of his best friends. The little one with the purple hair, like with Goten. 
but this Trunks was older and more like one of the lingering neural firings from his time on the planet that was being rained on by Comet Komori. This man was bad news, and so therefore Broly's already fragile mind was preparing itself to power up, and he does so going Super Saiyan Blue. I mean, wow. Trunks has only just arrived here, and now he's being shown the powers that the present have managed to present to him, and it's something even greater than Goku Black's power that Trunks has just run away from. Vegeta then shouts to Bulma to get Whis's butt right here pronto, as soon as possible, as he has to go Super Saiyan Blue himself just to counter Broly's power. And even though Vegeta should be strong enough to be able to deal with this kind of Broly, he simply can't. Broly's fury is outdoing Vegeta's power, and even with Goku leaping in to help, the two of them just can't stop Broly's onslaught. That's enough, Broly! Cease this madness, says Vegeta. Trunks then also realizes this person's identity. Broly, are you serious? That Broly? What's he doing here? The last time I saw him, he nearly destroyed us. Goku shouts back. No time to explain. Get your butt up here and help. Trunks complies with Goku's request and then powers up to Super Saiyan 2. This seems to only make Broly even angrier, as the memories are now flooding in even more of multiple people fighting him at the same time. A sudden spark of green energy envelopes the group, and the trio of Super Saiyans fall back as Broly begins to bulk up and fire off green energy blasts in all directions. Broly's old mania is returning, and his blue hair begins to lengthen, and his muscles expand exponentially. Trunks! You hurt Broly many years ago! Now I'll make you hurt! Vegeta is thinking the only saving grace here is that he doesn't remember the significance of Kakarot. If he did, then this may be the end of them all, all the entire universe. Broly is gazing hysterically at Trunks, and Trunks is powerless to stop him. An Omega Blaster is being prepared to strike the Hero of Time directly, but then suddenly, it disappears. Broly's eyes shut, and he falls to the ground in a heap. Whis appears from behind Broly, who was hovering right there at the time, and the angel has a far too pleased smile upon his face. You rang? Oh my, what happened here? Everyone is exasperated and turn to Whis as if to say, what took you so long? Whis retorts, what? I got here as fast as I could. I had to stop for a food run for Lord Beerus on the way though, so apologies if I took a couple of seconds longer than I should. After Broly has been subdued by Whis thanks to a handy dandy trink he learned to calm Beerus down, so we know it works and quite frankly with Whis you can just stick in any old power and it'll work, the gang inform him about what has happened and the events that transpired at the time of movie 8. Whis takes this all in and then recalls Something happening with Komori a long time ago, which caught his attention back in the day. Oh, I see. So that's what caused that comet to change course. I was wondering that. That thing was huge. The question is, though, what do we do with Broly? For now, they don't know. There's no telling what he might do now, with his mind seemingly to be unraveling with every passing minute. For a moment there, it was like he'd regressed all the way back to where he was back then. That their time together, being friends, allies, never happened. And that the nice and friendly ally that they once had was lost forever. One thing's for sure, Trunks can't be around him at the same time. Not right now. But Trunks isn't convinced. I knew he was bad news. Look how quickly he snapped the moment he laid eyes on me. He was faking the whole thing. Trunks, that's enough! Vegeta snaps back. Vegeta is not going to tolerate his son's lack of faith in Broly. This is hitting Vegeta the hardest of all. He had spent the most time with Broly, and to see him fully revert back to his old ways, that was pretty heartbreaking for the prince. It was like he'd lost a family member right now. Broly is not like the monster we fought back then. This Broly is someone I can trust. He is someone that I care about. And right now, I want to help him. I must help him. Vegeta looks serious. Trunks recalls a bit before looking away. For the next couple of hours, Broly is kept a close eye on. Beerus has now arrived after noticing Whis had vanished and is lamenting the Dragon Team's decision in taking on this Maverick in the first place. He always knew that that one was trouble. He shouldn't have been given the God Key. 
Vegeta is getting sick and tired of all this doubt. But that's when Goku Black comes into play. And with Broly out of the picture for the moment, the scene between Black, Goku, and the rest of the Dragon Team pretty much plays out as per normal. Now, you may be asking, is Broly in the future or not, Masako? Well, I don't want to say right now. Future Trunks came from a time when Broly didn't exist as we knew him, as that occurred right before the Boo Saga, movie 10, when he came to Earth. You know, the Broly in that timeline remained entombed in ice, and after all this time, it became very unlikely that he would ever be revived. And remember, I know that some of you may be saying, well, Broly wouldn't have existed in the first place. They wouldn't have fought him or something like that. He wouldn't have known about Kakarot. Well, he would have known about Kakarot for a start. And also, this is an April Fool what if, so he can be a little bit crazy. So let's just wait a little bit, and I'll show you what I'm cooking up later. For now, though, Goku Black is pulled back into the future and the gang process what just happened, with Bulma unearthing the other time machine she had from the time of the Cell Saga just to lift in Trunks' waning spirit that his own time machine had been destroyed. Soon, Trunks meets up with Gohan and the two of them talk for a while, over some ice cream, naturally. The conversation then turns to Broly and Gohan simply falls silent. Well, Gohan, what do you make of all of this? Can this Broly be trusted? Father seems to think the world of him. He can be trusted. However, his mind has been affected by Paragus during his childhood. He has left him more damage than we may have suspected. Also, the amount of power he has unlocked in such a short space of time? Yeah, that may have sped up the deterioration and undone all the work we had done to try and help him. Gohan then looks down, retrospectively. I think to myself what might have happened had I just destroyed him right the moment I first saw him here. But then I remember that Majin Buu would have been around, so... For that reason, I trust Broly. He's done more good for us than bad. Soon, the time comes for the gang to head back to the future in the repaired time machine. For the first trip, it happens like it does in the original, with Goku, Vegeta and Trunks heading to the future, you know, encountering Rose Black, and then having to retreat back to the present again, after, you know, getting their butts kicked and realising that despite their power, the power that the future exhibited at the time is just simply too great. Whis is present as Kid Trunks spots the others return, almost unconscious. When the three of them awaken, recovered, Whis debriefs that he has managed to put some kind of mental block on Broly for the time being, that managed to remove or at least obscure Trunks' true identity for the time being. It's not a permanent fix, but if it can just hold for the time that this future Trunks is around, it should buy them some time to try and find a better solution for fixing Broly's brain. Broly walks out looking very hazy, as if he'd been asleep for weeks, and greets Trunks cordially. Oh, hello. I didn't introduce myself. My name's Broly. Forgive me for my absence earlier. Trunks shakes his hand, but thinks, Oh, trust me, you introduced yourself plenty. Goku and Vegeta then inform Broly about what happened, and are very apprehensive, thinking that Whis's block is going to give out at any moment. This has not gone unnoticed. Broly can sense something is wrong. What's the matter, Master Vegeta? You seem a bit off. Vegeta is looking very pensive, but masks this with his usual bravado. That's no concern of yours, Broly. I'm fine. Broly now seemingly on side, for the moment, they can plan another venture into the future. Broly wonders if this future has a version of himself in it, but Goku says, well, doesn't look it, buddy. But Broly has a plan to verify this. With present Samasu being wiped out like before, the gang are now ready to go into the future for the second time. This time with Broly. With him there as well, Bomber is really scrunched up and has to sit on Vegeta's lap so as to not be crushed by all the big Saiyan bodies in there. And after getting out, the gang assess the situation and realize that the future, despite their efforts of getting rid of President Zamasu, has not changed at all. This version of West City is just as devastated as it was before. West City? Then that must mean... Broly sets his gaze on a location in the distance and promptly flies away. Broly, get back here! Too late. He's gone. Trunks is angry. I knew it! I knew Whis's plan would fail! Broly's turned his back on us! He's going to go and team up with Goku Black! I know it! No, boy, says Vegeta. He's not so worried. He's got the bit between his teeth. What has he figured out that we haven't? Now, after a while flying, Broly lands in a dense undergrowth of forest, which has seemingly been left untouched. Zamasu and Goku Black probably felt no need to tarnish this place, as animals weren't part of their plan. Broly looks around and nods. It's just like how I remember. 
Broly walks through the woodland for a while and discovers a massive patch of dirt which wasn't there in the present. Broly thinks for a moment, just going through his head, going back through all the memories that he can remember, and promptly starts to blast the ground dozens of times, which vaporizes the ground until he suddenly comes across a patch of ice, which has now started to melt due to the fact there's loads of key and key produces heat. Broly is looking curious. His suspicions may be right, and after breaking some more of the ice, he discovers something amazing. There, staring back at him, is himself. With more care, Broly melts the ice around this other Broly and warms the air using his key. For a few minutes, Broly just stands there, waiting for some movement to occur. I read some of the comments and people were really surprised to see this thing happen as well as being very confused. How would this Broly get here? He never went bonkers and saw Kakarot, so he would have ended in a pod and then entombed in ice still? Well, that's the beauty of the April Fool What If. We can get the same conclusion as the original timeline whilst changing the origins slightly. However, I'm not going to make it totally arbitrary. Let's just say in this universe, Paragus had pushed the boy too far one day, and basically, the collar that had kept him in check failed, and his power overflowed so much that Broly went crazy, and the only way to subdue him was to turn the collar off and on again, and overload it with his own key to the point of knocking Broly out. Magic works in weird ways. As a result of this, Paragus then loaded his son into one of their pods that they had been using to travel around the galaxy with and set a straight course. As the crow flies, not to land on a planet in particular, just keep speeding through space where he cannot pose a danger to anyone or even to himself. If he was able to escape, the vacuum of space would do its thing. It's dark, I know, but this boy could end up destroying whole galaxies out of anger, which is exactly what he did in the present timeline. So probably one day Broly's course got deviated by cosmic weather fronts and he landed on Earth and got buried in ice, albeit younger than his present counterpart. Mind you, Saiyans pretty much remain similar in appearance and stature between the ages of 18 and 80, so there is not much of a visual distinction between the two. Our Broly has noticed that the future Broly has begun to twitch and judder in the now large puddle that was once hosting a glacier. It worked, says our Broly as he floats downwards to land next to the other version of himself. What? What happened? Who are you? The future Broly is looking absolutely out of it, and spots a being who looks similar to himself. This may be hard to explain, but I am you from another time. You Broly? And me Broly? We are both Broly. You were frozen in ice, just like I was. You're alive. Where's my father? I don't know, but you are on Earth. There are more Saiyans here, and right now, we need your help. I hate to bother you after you just woke up, but it's important. The world is about to be consumed by an evil power. Saiyans? Who? Meanwhile, the gang have headed to the Resistance base to find that future Mai was out cold, and we have the same thing happening as it did in the original. But this time, Vegeta is a bit more preoccupied with his own thoughts and the whereabouts of his apprentice instead of whether or not Goku had kissed Chi Chi before. Then he looks to his Saiyan counterpart. Kakarot, what could Broly be up to? Oh no. Vegeta immediately gets up and tells Kakarot to stay where he is. He has to find Broly. Why can't we just teleport there? It's too risky, Kakarot. You know why. Before Goku can figure out why this might be too dangerous and why Vegeta's so concerned, the prince is out the door and running out of the city, trying to evade the gaze and energy detection of a potentially nearby Goku Black. Then it dawns on Goku. This future Broly might not have had the same state of amnesia as their one had, but might have had the same initial rage spark. Oh dear. Back with the two Brolies, and the relaxed one casually states, Prince Vegeta's son, Kakarot, you know what's coming here. The now awakened Broly immediately looks wide-eyed and stands up straight. Kakarot! Kakarot's here? Wait, how do you know Kakarot? The future Broly twitches again and is getting more and more aggressive. What's going on? Why are you so angry at me saying Kakarot? The future Broly screams before looking intensely at his past counterpart. If you are Broly too, then why doesn't your blood boil at the speaking of his name? Why would it? Kakarot has been nothing but kind to me. He's had the answers for me as long as I can remember. 
What can Broly remember? Or are you imposter? Our Broly is starting to look very confused and a little bit worried. Had he done the wrong thing? He can feel this version's key starting to bubble and boil. Sort of like his own key when he gets all fired up. This can't be good. Wait, stop! I know what you're doing! Listen to me! Kakarot is not the bad guy here! He's done nothing wrong! You gotta believe me, Broly! Broly is starting to scream louder and louder and starts to attack his own version. If you are helping Kakarot, then you are enemy! Roar! Broly then has to be careful here. He can't attack himself too much, or else this whole exercise would have been in vain. He'd look stupid in front of his master. You'd think this would be easy for our boy to handle, but the unpredictable key is not helping his efforts to keep this whole thing in check. Luckily for him though, Vegeta arrives to assist, and together, they are able to knock out the Berserk Saiyan. Vegeta turns to our chap and looks horrified. Broly, what do you think you're doing? This version of you is out of control. That and Black is far stronger than him. What makes you think he can help? He's of no use to anyone. Our Broly is feeling a little bullish right now and decides to push back. I have a question for you, Master. Why does this version of me hate Kakarot so much? I don't hate Kakarot. What's the difference between him and me? Vegeta stops his tirade and begins to look solemn. He hoped that this day would never come, as it could doom them all. There is something that I need to tell you, Broly. Something that happened to you, and why you think the way you do. I will tell you, but that will have to wait until after we get home. Right now, we have unfinished business to attend to, and a future to save. Broly looks absolutely nonplussed. Master... What's going on? You're scaring me. All that you need to know is that as far as this monster's concerned, Black is Kakarot. While we are here, refer to our Kakarot as his Earth name. Got it? Why? Just do it! He may be weak in comparison, but having something unpredictable to read can only stall their rampage. Vegeta and Broly take the sleeping Broly back to base and rest him down on some cushions and inform Goku about what's going on. This guy hasn't been to the meeting where screaming Kakarot is not a bad thing. Kakarot, what's going on? Why is he like this? It's a long story, Broly. I'll tell you later when we're done with all this. Broly doesn't like this stalling. That's what Master said. I don't like this secrecy. Trust me. This is for your own good. Broly promises to go along with this for now, but he does want answers when they get home. It's a necessary evil, and there is no hiding from this guy's past anymore. When this future Broly wakes up, he is surprised to see everyone, and faces looking back at him. But thankfully, his mind hasn't remembered the previous engagement and tussle from earlier. Where am I? The name's Goku. I'm a Saiyan. And these are my friends, who are also Saiyan, as well as humans. We need your help, Broly. How do you know Broly's name? Vegeta strongly steps up. That's not important right now. What matters is that we have a favor to ask of you, Saiyan, and something that you're looking for. A certain person. Outside, Goku Black makes his presence known by blowing up a nearby pile of rubble. Come on out, Saiyans. I know you're here. Up there is Kakarot. Kakarot! Broly stands up straight and runs outside to see Goku Black, or Kakarot to him looking around for people to destroy. Kakarot! Goku Black looks down and acts drolly. Oh, you're talking to me? <laughs> Forgive me, I don't talk to simpletons. Kakarot! Broly's eyes white out, and he screams out in rage, his body swelling up and his power increasing exponentially. From the doorway, the rest of the Saiyans are watching this unfold and are terrified. Are Broly looking especially scared, as well as ashamed? Is this what I look like, Master, when I get angry? Vegeta isn't responding. He's watching this other Broly like a space hawk. Goku Black is not particularly bothered by this new specimen. He's seen tons like this before who think they can be the one to stop him, but this one won't be any different. His energy may be increasing, yes, but it's still pretty feeble when in the presence of something beautiful like himself. He does not need to whip out the British accent transformation just yet. Does this little animal want to play? Fine. Come and face me, Black. Broly lands a punch to Black's face, taking the powerhouse by surprise. Kakarot! Broly then manages to get a few more hits on Black before the balance realigns itself and the two of them are locked in intense combat. 
Down on the ground, Trunks and Mai are marshalling the resistance to get out of the area as things could get very bad if this Broly is allowed to go all out like a whirling dervish, like it seems that Vegeta wants him to do. Our Broly is watching this all happen and is mesmerized, bizarrely, at this overflowing key. It feels practically identical to how he feels sometimes. He's putting two and two together. Does Saiyan Kakarot really make this change in power happen? Did it used to work on himself? He's starting to think the wrong things. But meanwhile, Goku Black is getting more and more frustrated at this lack of respect for a powerful god as he, as well as wondering where all of this power is coming from. It's coming out of nowhere, seemingly. For the first time ever, he hasn't got a clue, and this is getting under his skin, and he screams, ENOUGH! He lets out a pulse of key which sends Broly flying backwards into more rubble. There's a lot of it, trust me. I will not be made a fool of by such a filthy animal! Cowards! Face me instead of hiding behind this freak of nature! Vegeta laughs to himself. Excellent. He's getting angry. This is our chance to turn this around. So long as the green man doesn't interfere. Broly looks to the rubble where the other one landed and is not appreciating Vegeta's attitude. Like this version is some kind of tool or object and not worth his time, really. That could have been him if things happened differently. That's what it's for you. Vegeta, who originally wanted to face Black alone, actually then shows up by powering up to Blue and launching himself at Goku Black. The latter still raging and fuming against this impertinent interloper and bizarre creature. He has not enough time to transform and he is winded severely before regaining his composure and transforms into Rosé. At last, a fight where I can converse with someone with half a brain. Vegeta is not responding to these remarks and chooses to get the job done. He charges forward again, but from behind, an explosion of ki erupts and the Broly that we are very familiar with emerges and speeds past Vegeta and begins to charge an Omega Blast, that famed attack at Black, who thinks that this power should be nothing, but it's still troubling him all the same. It's so new and erratic that he can't just simply overpower it. It's going to hit him, and it does. Black is engulfed in green energy and is feeling considerable pain. Vegeta chooses not to dwell on this and relies on this further distraction to overwhelm Goku Black even more with a barrage of his own. And as that's happening, this is enough to attract the attention indeed of future Zamasu, who is personally wondering what is causing his partner so much trouble? His key is fading and all over the place. I don't remember there being another Saiyan around here. This one is new, it seems, and he's certainly a challenge, but not one that we gods can't handle. With this, Goku Black is now looking very ragged, his clothes completely torn to shreds, and his eyes looking manic with fury at this key that he can't get a handle on, despite him being theoretically stronger than this beast. Vegeta is smiling. You see, Black? You may be stronger, but you are no match for pure, unbridled energy. This guy's not going to stop. Goku Black is starting to look fearful. Goku Black, even with his British Rosé powers, is unable to get the upper hand from these mortal fools, despite forgetting that this body he is in is also mortal. That's convenient, that. Zamasu hasn't jumped in yet, feeling that his colleague should be able to continuously improve his way out of this problem. This was nothing. He had faith in him. But the thing is, though, Goku Black can't. You see, as we know from the movies, the original Broly, and sort of the new one as well, is relentless when it comes to the likes of seeing Kakarot. And that, who he is focused on, is basically Goku Black, assuming him for the other one. Sensing that Black is on the verge of exhaustion, the rest of the gang then try their best to get into the mix, with the future Broly's rampage going on around them. Together, they join their key blast together and aim a blast at Goku Black, and it connects. The Saiyan Kai hybrid self is damaged severely by this, and when the light dissipates, he is collapsed on the ground, out of his rosé power, no longer having a British accent, and totally on the brink of passing. Vegeta walks over to him and kicks him into a pile of rubble nearby. He wanted to do that for so long, for two reasons in fact. First, how dare this monster destroy the future of his son, and secondly, it's because this fool looked like Kakarot and so in a way it was like about an indirect catharsis. Goku Black can barely lift his body up off the ground and he is totally broken. 
How? How? How did this body fail? He starts to tear up and slam the ground out of frustration. Where had his partner been throughout all of this? Why had he abandoned him? The son of Vegeta is amazed with how everything has gone so smoothly in terms of relying on a berserker for the win. Too amazed. Suddenly, a flash of flesh and greenish yellow streaks past the group. Father, look out! Before Vegeta can turn around fully, the future Broly scoops him up as well as Goku Black and launches them into the air. Kakarot is mine! Vegeta is left vulnerable by the surprise attack, and the person to revel in all of this confusion the most is Zamasu. He claps softly as if he intended all of this to happen. I've got to hand it to you, mortals. That was very clever. Relying on pure energy wrapped around flesh and blood to do your dirty work? <laughs> Go to the top of the class. However, you forgot that pure energy on its own has no master. You got what you wanted, yes, but it's not over yet. And now you'll have to face the consequences. That's why you mortals cannot be trusted with power such as this. You have just simply given me the proof that I need that what we have done together was the right thing to do. He watches Broly pummeling his comrade for a little longer, not in the least bit worried for the safety of him. Our Broly is sickened by this coldness. This may be an alien melding of peoples, and these two are bad guys, but how can he be so cruel still to what is his ally? Samasu turns to Broly on the ground and can sense what he is thinking, and raises a finger, wagging it. Now I know what you're thinking, that I'm being such a bad friend to that one up there. Oh, this is all part of the plan. My new plan. I'm not worried, for I have this. He takes off the patara from his left ear and dangles it in front of Broly. He doesn't know what it is, but Goku does. He immediately knows what he is planning on doing, but before he can leap in and stop it, too late. Now I bet you're wondering how Goku knows about this, because they never needed to rely on this Patara fusion, or any fusion for that matter. Well, Goku still knew about all these kinds of fusion from the afterlife, and also knowing about it from the old Kai, and all of that kind of stuff. I'm sure there's been constant communication in that regard. I mean, Goku was away for a good long time, so yeah, I think he would have met some people, including Shin. Whilst in the mix of Vegeta and future Broly, Goku Black can feel a warmth from his right ear. It is time. He starts to laugh, knowing what's about to happen. He had been saved, and now all these mortal freaks will pay for their impertinence. The pull of Patara grips him, and he, as well as Zamasu, are drawn to each other at a fantastic speed. There is an almighty flash, and out of this, we get fused Zamasu. The power is incredible, much more than any individual being there, but there is a difference to the version that we got in the original. This version of fused Zamasu is a little bit weaker than before due to the condition of Goku Black upon them fusing. He hadn't been left much time to recover, or indeed any time to recover actually, and it was very rushed, so thusly, he isn't as dominant as before, but right now, he is still the top banana. Frustrated by having his prize taken away from him, future Broly takes out his anger on Vegeta for just that little while longer, before trying his luck on Fuse Zamasu. Kakarot had been taken from him, and this green man had been the one to do it in his mind. Therefore, he should be the one to receive Broly's justice. Vegeta is left in a freefall before being caught by Trunks, who gets him out of the area as this is all beginning to kick off. Future Broly fires an Omega Blaster at Fuse Zamasu, but it does nothing. The deity turns to him and has venom in his gaze. He's got a score to settle with this one. He remembers the pain and fury that Goku Black felt just now. I commend your power, simpleton, but I cannot allow you to live any longer. Kakarot? Where is Kakarot? You took Kakarot! The fusion chuckles and says, <laughs> Yes, I did. I can show you where I sent him, if you like. As well as his kind soon enough. Or maybe right now. He then rushes Future Broly and slams a punch in his stomach, winding him, and then doing a similar thing to what happened in Movie 8. Future Broly can feel the key inside of him rupturing his skin, and he cannot contain this anymore. He is writhing around in the air, and a few seconds later, he explodes in a sea of green energy. Few Zamasu doesn't run away from this or fly out of the area. Instead, he just simply basks in this blast and takes in the feeling of satisfaction. Oh, that felt good. 
The green key bays the green man, and he feels on top of the world. Our Broly is left horrified by this. His plan had failed, and not only that, that could have easily happened to him. In fact, it sort of did in the original. But right now, it's best not to tell him that. Him witnessing this is more than enough to break him and have him collapse to the floor. All of this. He has even more questions left for his friends when they get out of this. If they ever get out of this. When the light fades, Feud Zamasu turns to the others and laughs out loud. I'm sorry that I broke your pet devil, mortals. He was a true freak, a genuine demon even. One that I could not let live. Much like the rest of you now that you tremble at my feet and majesty. He spreads his arms and prepares an attack ready to wipe out the world below. Blades of Justice. Goku knows that with all of this, they cannot counter it right now, especially without the future Broly there to act as a deterrent. As Zamasu is charging up this attack, Goku instant transmissions to Broly, and then as many people as he can gather and teleport them out of there before Zamasu unleashes his fury, merely to act as a last act of fear inducing. I think he got that point across quite well. Goku couldn't think of anywhere else other than where he had sensed Broly earlier, and Honestly, this was actually a good distance away to provide time. But time for what? With Vegeta getting his bearings back, he is pondering about the idea of heading back to the past to regroup, and then try again once healed up. However, Trunks and Broly round on him and say that they don't have time, ironically, to try and do this, because this power of Zamasu's is so great and his will so strong right now that... It was lucky that he hadn't just wiped them out already. Like, he let them get away. He was toying with them. And so something had to be done right now. Meanwhile, Goku is pondering about something. Something that he remembered when he was in the other world. He remains quiet. He then makes his idea known for the first time in the series. Fusion. If Zamasu had fused, then they could too. Kaka! Goku! Vegeta stops himself in the midst of his pupil. How can we fuse like them? We don't have those wretched earrings to hand. He talks about the Metamorum fusion. Vegeta is perplexed by this. A fusion of two beings without the need of earrings? He's interested. But he's then not so interested when it comes to the fact that it involves a little bit of dancing. Vegeta is just... Oh. Oh. As you may know. And it's just so predictable right now. But Goku says it's the only thing they can do in the here and now. And yeah, Vegeta ultimately, as you can imagine, refuses to do it. And despite Goku's pleas, he does not budge. So much for Gogeta. I'm sorry you're not going to get him. However, there is one person who does step up. I will do it, Kakarot. You see, I can say that name. It seems that my master has lost his resolve as well as his faith in me and my fortitude. He scowls at his master, who is surprised that he had been so perceptive and that the name had no effect. The mood is bad between them right now. I wish to prove myself, so I will fuse with you, for my future self. He didn't deserve to be treated like an accessory. He had a chance to live, and now it's gone, stolen from him. I will avenge him. It's clear that he isn't doing this solely for his friends this time, but also for himself and his future self. Realizing that they don't have much time for bickering before Zamasu finds them, the two have no choice but to start practicing the routine. Broly is picking this up quite quickly. Remarkably so too, which Goku notes, trying to ease the tension a little, but it doesn't work. Broly is far too focused on the task at hand. The time has come for them to fuse for their lives. They perform the dance and a light, similar to Zamasu's just now, erupts and consumes the woodland. When it settles, we get a fusion of Goku and Broly, Karoli. That's right, we are bringing in the fusion from the 3DS game, Dragon Ball Fusions. It's a very good game by the way, you should check it out. It was bonkers then, it will be bonkers now. Without a word, Karoli instant transmissions himself into the battlefield in the presence of Fuse Zamasu. The green fusion immediately recognizes the garb. Well, well, I didn't expect that the Metamorans would ever share their secrets with Saiyans. This will be very, very interesting. Futile for you, but interesting for me. Karoli is focused still, the nerve from Broly reigning supreme as he gets into Goku's signature stance and powers up to Super Saiyan. Karoli's first strike against Fu Zamasu is enough to surprise him, not hurt him, but give him pause for thought. My, the pet has claws. Too bad that you caught my attention. 
That will be the last time that you strike me. Zamasu then strikes Karoli down, back to the ground, but the fusion isn't that flawed. You're nothing special, Zamasu. All that build up, and for what? Just some pompous fool with a giant frisbee on his back. Zamasu is getting a little ticked off by this. Shut your mouth, mortal! You wouldn't want your last words to be so vulgar now, would you? Crowley shrugs. I can wait you out. I know that the stronger you get, the shorter you have to even come close to my majesty. I don't need that long now that I have an idea of what makes you tick. Crowley gets into position and then powers up into Super Saiyan Blue. That Super Saiyan thing? Oh, that was just a test. The jump in power is very apparent soon enough. Zamasu doesn't wait to find out. He unleashes his Blades of Judgment technique down on the ground, to which Karoli disappears amidst. Vegeta and the others can sense this going on from afar, back in the forest, miles away, and are wondering if they should actually go in and try and help Karoli. Trunks wants to be the one to end things so desperately himself, but he does know that he is in the midst of something that he cannot win on his own. Vegeta then looks to the horizon and sighs. I let him down. What? Who did you let down, father? Broly. I should have fused with him. Together, we would have been mighty. A culmination of all the training that we had done. Instead, I let Kakarot get the upper hand. I fear that my tenure as a master is compromised. Trunks, can you remember how that stupid fusion thing works? Trunks gasps and tries to recollect the situation. He ponders about what his father would mean by that. Meanwhile, back at the scene, Zamasu cannot sense Karoli amongst his blades and he is feeling rather victorious. But then he gets a vicious double-fisted head slam which then catapults him into his own attack to which he can barely escape from. In fact, he actually does get nicked by one blade, but only just. It's enough to get his attention. Up in the sky is Karoli, resplendent in his blue aura. Careful, Zami! You almost ended yourself! That attack isn't that practical if you move, ha <laughs> ha! Zamasu is getting more and more frustrated with this pest, far more annoyed than he ever got with Vegito. He launches himself at the Saiyan fusion, and the proper fight begins, with the pair of them fairly equal in power, but with the composure and confidence of the latter, Karoli not batting an eyelid, Zamasu's integrity is starting to falter. Much like after Goku's Kaioken blue attack, the Kai's visage is starting to corrupt on one side, and eventually his bogged up rage form is apparent to which Karoli takes great mirth from. He's got under its skin. Wow! I didn't think angelic beings could be so ugly! Zamasu is just fueling his own downfall at this point. He is just making it harder for himself. He's berserking out more and more at being denied his victory by such an annoying entity. Just a little longer! Zamasu mutters to himself, thinking that the fusion is going to split sometime soon, given the power that was being outputted. What's the matter? Getting scared? You started this, Zamasu. End it. I don't care how. Zamasu looks up and seethes. If that's what you want seeing! Zamasu screams to the skies and a huge surge of energy exudes from his body. I will make you regret your posturing! I will wipe this world out in an instant before finishing what I started! You should never have angered me, mortal! You have doomed your own world! Karoli is actually getting a little worried right now. Uh, the Goku inside of him remembers this happening before with the likes of Semi-Perfect Cell and Freezer. They've got previous. So, this guy too was having a big hissy fit at not having his own way. But having said that, he knew that the Kai was right. Time was running out on many levels. But there was something odd though. He couldn't feel his body running out of time like Fusion usually does. What's going on? Was Broly's overflowing key perhaps keeping this fusion together? I mean, there's no time to figure this out right now. I mean, obviously you've got a very angry Kai that you're trying to calm down, or better yet, try and destroy the guy. Karoli then, in that moment, decides to unleash a counterattack, Planet Geyser. It's risky, but this should be enough to try and cancel out what Zamasu is trying to do. In one go, Karoli gets into position, and the geyser connects with Zamasu's surging attack. Now, granted, it's a struggle, and Karoli can feel his body starting to reach its limits by now, but it needs to keep going. Sure enough, the attack is enough to try and disrupt Zamasu's anger, and there is a huge cataclysmic explosion which eliminates the surrounding half-mile, except for the combatants. 
when the smoke clears, Karoli lands down on the ground to find traces of Zamasu's clothing. Had... had he done it? Well, I mean, right now, he could not sense his energy like before. But yeah, victory! Got him! To quote another fusion, Yosha! That is until Zamasu shows up. He grabs Karoli in a full Nelson and is raving about how he had enough of this. Forget his plan now. He just wanted everything to stop so he could finally get some peace. Being halted by this being right at the final hurdle was enough to tip Zamasu over past the brink of insanity. I don't care about my plan anymore. All I care about is ending this blasted torture. Karoli's getting unsettled. Despite knowing the fact that Broly's output is helping elongate his time in the battle, it can't last forever. He tries to escape, but he can't. Zamasu's power is surging like crazy again. But suddenly, Zamasu stops. He turns around to see Vegeta and Trunks looking on. He particularly is shooting a glare at Trunks. Trunks, why won't you die? I'm not gonna give you the satisfaction, you freak. Vegeta. I shut out of sheer determination and sort of embarrassment, initiates the fusion dance. Samasu tries to drop Karoli, but Karoli stops him. No, you don't. You wanted me? You got me. We now see the arrival of Vegetunks on the battlefield. In one instant, the second fusion launches itself at Zamasu, and together with Karoli, they then pincer Zamasu, squashing the Kai together, pinning him down. This pain, as well as the pressure, is seeing an even more advanced degradation of the Kai's fusion than we ever saw in the original. The left side of Zamasu is starting to melt even further, and he now can no longer muster power from his left side with it writhing about. What is this? Why can't I move? Vegetunks pipes up. It's because you rushed into this. You forgot that your friend wasn't immortal like you. That half of you can no longer cope. And well, I think you can feel what's happening. Zamasu can indeed feel what's happening. His essence was unraveling, his spirit starting to dissolve. This wasn't going to just be a simple defusion. This was him coming apart. He could feel his mind going, being replaced with unbridled fury. He was basically turning into, into a mindless mortal. He was scared. No, he was petrified. It can't end like this. No. no! Zamasu's body was contorting itself as it was being squeezed by Karoli and Vegetunks before, boom, an arc of energy explodes around the fusions and nobody can sense what is going on. When the light clears, Zamasu is gone. Not a trace was left. Not even those weird little sparkles that we saw in the original after Trunks sliced him in half. Wait, Masako, how come his essence isn't there? Does that mean that this future is saved? Yes. You see, the arrival of Vegetunks meant that Zamasu's mind was being undone and his drive was compromised by the sheer frustration of Karoli, and thusly, the spirit of Zamasu from both ends was damaged beyond repair. Thusly, he had become a monster with no mind to speak of and with a ton of energy. Where is that energy going to go? Well, we saw in Broly, upwards and outwards, bathing the earth with a healing force which removed the green clouds from above and left the world basking in the clear night sky for the first time in years. Zamasu had truly been removed from this realm. The two fusions gaze at one another for a split second, smile, before Karoli splits back into Broly and Goku. Vegetunk stands there and bows to Broly. You did well, Broly. I am proud of you. I am sure the Vegeta in me would wish to express that himself. Broly, tired and exhausted, smiles back and feels satisfied with his lot. In time, Vegetunks diffuses as well, and the four of them then start to assess the situation. Mai regroups as well with Trunks, and together they then inform what was left of the people around as well as the resistance that it was truly over. Goku himself is looking around in case Zamasu would then return in some form. Well, he needn't have worried. This time, the Kai had been expunged, all thanks to his own madness. When things did become clear that it was seriously going to be alright, Goku, Vegeta and Broly then start to make their goodbyes to the Resistance and together with Trunks, head back in time to then collect themselves back into the present. And then once everything had been refueled and was ready to go, Trunks was ready to head back to start the reconstruction effort for the second time. 
Vegeta then tells Trunks that there is a capsule located in the time machine that could be of use. This should help speed the process up. Find new Nemec if it's still out there, and heal your universe. Well done, my son. Trunks smiles and promises to do his best and to not bother the past again. I apologize, Trunks, for my impertinence, Broly says to Trunks, having calmed down tremendously, but he still has that headlock that Whis had placed on him. No problem, Broly. I'm glad this is all over and that you're at peace. My future needs to heal once again. Take care, all of you. And with that, Trunks heads back into the future and ready to start anew. For the next few days, Broly tries to repair his relationship with Vegeta, and Vegeta feels the need to do that himself. He had lost faith in his pupil, and that had hurt Broly immensely. It would take time, but the prince knew that he had to regain trust in both himself as well as his pupil. Having said that though, Broly was having to deal with something else, he had something to think about. Whilst the act of fusion with Kakarot was pretty awesome, and it was amazing to have that kind of power and confidence behind it, it left him with something weird. It had left him with something just at the back of his mind, something he didn't like. He had actually, without realizing, shared a mind with Goku, Kakarot. We're not quite sure how fusion works when two minds become one per se, but I feel for the sense of this story, it would be thematically intriguing to say where this might go. Broly's mind had reformed quite nicely since being discovered by Goten, but there were still gaps in his memory from before being discovered by the son of Goku. Gaps that were never replaced or filled in or completely gotten rid of, but fusing with Kakarot had started to do so. He was beginning to remember from prior to his bump on the head. Kakarot's influence had begun to resurge. Broly's mind was potentially beginning to relapse with no hope of being able to fix it. The crying young Kakarot by his bedside, King Vegeta trying to end him with a blade, Paragus, his father. It was all coming back to him, slowly but very surely. He had begun to resent Kakarot once more. Now he knew why Kakarot had been so important to him for so long. It wasn't because he would bring understanding or solace, quite the opposite in fact. Kakarot had initially ruined his life, and for the longest time, they had lived in destitution. The only thing that had kept him from wasting Kakarot right there and then when he started to think about it was the life he had after. He needed to get away from here. One night, Broly took a ship from Capture Corp and set off into space. Before anyone knew what happened or where he went, he was long gone, and attempts to contact him were met with silence. We resume our story a little bit after he left Earth, and Vegeta was trying to figure out what had happened to make Broly vanish like that, without a single word to anyone. It was very unlike him. He was clearly still in sound mind, because apparently when he took said vessel, nobody was harmed, and nobody saw him looking suspicious, irate, or crazy. He'd been quite civil in fact, albeit a little bit snippy with his words, a bit short, but that could happen to anyone. There was no trace of resentment or anger in him. Hence why nobody had reported it until the morning. For hours, he was racking his brain, Vegeta, trying to figure out the cause of this disappearance. Then it dawned on him. Kakarot, he remembers. He gets out of bed, leaving a pregnant Bulma to her slumber in the morning light. She rolled over without sensing her husband leaving, and he was on his way to Mount Palzu. When the prince arrived there, he found Kakarot training on his own, as per usual, but also looking equally baffled at the sight of Vegeta. Kakarot! Vegeta stumps over to his rival and looks at him with a serious expression. Oh, hey Vegeta, what brings you here? You don't usually come here to train. Actually, you've never come here to train. I have no intention of training with you right now. I figured it out. Figured what out? Goku blinks. Why, Broly's gone. He remembers everything from when we first met on that wild goose chase Paragus laid out for us. He knows why you are so important to him. The real reason. And he can't take it. Goku thinks for a moment and can't explain why he could know. Nobody had told him. That's the point. It's probably because nobody told him that he's gone rogue. I'd be the same if I were him. All the lies and deceit for so long. That affects him greatly, I imagine. Goku is now getting curious as to why Vegeta is getting so worried. Why would he even care? He didn't seem like the caring type for such matters. Vegeta then looks at him with an evil glare. I care because he's my responsibility. I took charge of him, Kakarot, when you wouldn't. 
or didn't offer yourself. What matters is that we need to find him and set him straight. As the two of them talk, Piccolo arrives, having heard the conversation just now. Namekian, would you cease your eavesdropping for once? All right, I guess you didn't want to hear my idea anyway. Idea? Mentions Goku. Well, any idea would be great right now. If trying to calm his mind is what you're looking for, then maybe you could take him somewhere where he can do so. Set his head straight. You mean tell Whis to give him another dose of what he did in front of Trunks? Mentioned Vegeta. Piccolo shakes his head. No, that would only be a small bandage or a gaping wound. It won't last. Piccolo looks up and then brings up Yardrat. Goku, what was that training like? Did it help you focus at all? Goku thinks for a second, trying to recollect his time there all those years ago. Well, yeah, it did, but it was really boring, though. I had to skip most of it when I sensed Frieza was heading for Earth, but, you know, Trunks saved the day. Uh, yeah, well, I guess it could be handy. But we still need to find Broly, though, and convince him to come with us for training. Vegeta crosses his arms and offers to go look for him. I'll go. Like I said, he's my responsibility. He can see Goku putting his hand up, offering to go with him as well, but the prince shakes his head. You're the last person who should go. Remember, one look at you might make him blow up wherever we stand. You stay here. Now we just need a lead. King Kai then decides to interject for the first time since Broly left. I can help you there, prince. K K King Kai? Goku stammers. Why didn't I think of asking you before? Yeah, says the king with indignation. Why didn't you? Am I really that forgettable these days? Did you forget that you killed me? Is that how it is, Goku? Huh? Enough! Shouts Vegeta. If you've got any leads, tell us now! Broly is a danger to the universe, King, with the power he's learnt. With King Kai calmed down, he then informs them that he could sense Broly's energy drifting across the galaxy. With no real destination in particular, he was just drifting around. Towards South Galaxy. Wait. South Galaxy, mutters King Kai. Why is it, Riga? Oh no, we need to go. No! The gang assume that with his mind so broken right now, he might be regressing back to his more recent memories prior to his arrival on Earth and his most recent core memory prior to that. And that was the destruction of South Galaxy. Was he about to decimate it for a second time? Goku transmits Piccolo and Vegeta back to Capture Corp, and the Prince orders one of the remaining space vehicles to be primed for launch. Goku offers to go with Vegeta one more time, but the Prince ignores him, insisting that he be the one to bring Broly back. When the ship blasts off, Vegeta starts to work the control systems and scanners, locking onto the codes and serial numbers of the ship that Broly had taken. That was a little bit of a help. And luckily, since leaving Earth's atmosphere, and with perhaps hints from King Kai along the way, he was actually able to get a good lock on, and he was now on autopilot in hot pursuit. With everything in place, the Vegeta turns around and spots... K Kakarot! What the- Hey Vegeta! I knew you would take no for an answer, so I decided to answer it for you! I'm coming along! Vegeta is shouting expletives at Goku for minutes on end. But in the end, Goku honestly and sincerely responds as to why he's coming along. This is all my fault, Vegeta. I should have been honest with him from the start. Because of me, he's losing his mind. And he might end up losing more than that if he's not careful. We gotta bring him back and get him to Yardrat. It's our only hope of getting his mind under control for good. Please, believe me, Vegeta. I want to help. No, you don't want to help him. You want to fight him, don't you? That's why you're here mutters the prince, getting the real reason Goku is here. No! This is important! I'm serious, Vegeta! Let me help you! He offers his hand to Vegeta to assert this, but the prince turns away. But that being said, he does finally accept Goku being here. Just don't get in my way! And don't do anything stupid! You got that! Kakarot nods, and the two now set off for Broly's craft. Together, they get closer and closer to Broly's ship, and after what seemed like days, they find it. But instead of landing exactly next to the craft, they decide to land on a nearby planet and transmit to Broly from there. When they get their resolve going, they nod at each other. Are you prepared to do the dance, Vegeta? He blushes and grudgingly nods. At least nobody that we know can witness it. It's so embarrassing. With that, they arrive to find Broly screaming at the top of his lungs, green energy spewing from his person in a marvel-like fashion up into the sky. 
Its length is as far as the eye can see. Its limits beyond measure. Whatever he was doing, it was certainly dramatic. What is he doing? ponders Vegeta. But Goku can make a very solid guess. He's trying to siphon off his overflowing key, sending it out into space. He must know that his body can't take it, or he's trying to keep himself from losing it. Maybe there's still something left of his fortitude after all. Let's hope that it doesn't come to anything life-threatening, says Vegeta. Vegeta carefully flies towards Broly and calls out his name. The arc doesn't cease, and Broly turns his head amidst the green energy. Vegeta, what are you? Don't do this, Broly! You've come so far! Don't throw it all away! Do not descend to the depths that your father led you all those years ago! You're better than that! We can help you! Let us help you! Please, Broly! Vegeta looks stern and resolute despite his emotive words. Broly's face starts to soften a little. The shaft of energy starts to shrink a little bit as his expression relaxes. But, yeah, Goku immediately misreads the situation thinking it was all done, flies into view. Before he can even say a word, Broly's face contorts into rage again. Kakarot! You imbecile, what are you doing? Get out of here! Vegeta, you tricked me! Kakarot! The arc, instead of shrinking, expands even larger than it was before. It explodes in brilliant white light, and we are met with legendary Super Saiyan Blue Broly at full power. Its eyes white out, and its frame is larger than ever. Damn it! Why did I even agree to him coming? Kakarot, come and fix your mess! Kakarot is looking worried, but he promises to help. They both power up to blue, and together they try to stop Broly by force, something they hope they didn't have to do. The ground around them is being torn up second by second as the battle intensifies. The pair of Saiyans do have the upper hand against Broly, but only for the first few moments of the tussle, because it was very clear that Broly's body was pumping out Ki faster and faster by the second. Instead of pushing it out of his body like he was doing before, the green energy was now surrounding the Saiyan and being used within its body against his teachers. He was completely and utterly out of control. Goku then pushes into something he had been working on. He hoped it would work. Kaioken Blue. Does it work? Nope. Broly is still beating him down, focusing on him more. Kakarot! Vegeta is getting very vivid flashbacks to the days of that time, before Comet Komori decimated that farce of a world that was reportedly New Planet Vegeta. He hoped he would never have to relive those days again, but here he was. Kakarot! He shouts. We have to do that stupid dance! It's the only way to save him! Goku is surprised to hear Vegeta offering to do this, and in a fit of enthusiasm, kicks Broly out of the way, enough time to transmit to Vegeta, and then fuse into Gogeta. Gogeta gazes at Broly, and the latter stares back without recognition. However, the battle is now pretty conclusive. This Gogeta, instead of the one in Dragon Ball Super Broly, where he's basically a carbon copy of Vegito, was far more methodical and to the point, like in Fusion Reborn. Instead of blustering around like a carbon copy of Vegito, like I said, Gogeta quietly powers up to blue and starts to overpower Broly, which in turn makes Broly push even more. With one final attack, Broly pulls out an Omega Blaster against Gogeta's Stardust Breaker. The two attacks connect, but the Breaker surges through the blaster like a drop of washing up liquid surging water away. That cool science experiment? It hits Broly and is enough to make his body shudder and shake with pain before sending the body to the floor in a heap, unconscious but alive. For a few seconds, Gogeta watches over him looking for any signs of movement. After a minute, it was clear that he wasn't going to be getting up anytime soon. Gogeta lands in front of him and places a hand on his forehead. Broly, he mutters to himself. Don't, Don't give up. When Gogeta defuses, Goku transmits both Vegeta and Broly back to their ship and they head for Yardrat directly. When they get there, Broly is still out cold thanks to all the energy that he'd used up. He was injured too, which made him less likely to blow up again. The two Saiyans exit the ship and rush to Bibara's chamber. The Yardratians are surprised to see Goku back again, but they make way for the pair of them to carry Broly to their master's quarters. When Pibara sees the three of them arrive, he hails Goku. Ah, Son Goku, what a surprise. It's been so long since we last met. 
Have you come back to finish up your training? Another time, perhaps, mister. But we got something we need your help with. Our friend's mind is in danger. Danger, you say? Hmm. Bibar looks down at Broly, whose face is calm and in a state of sleep. That is until his white eyes open suddenly and stare back at Bibara. Broly was awake. Pibara and Broly's eyes met. The white and empty pools laying down on the mat were filled with rage, despite being devoid of character. It was clear that Broly, even with his energy and ki at a relatively low level, he was still recovering from all of the output that he exerted earlier. He was still quite dangerous though to anyone on Yardrat who wasn't Goku or Vegeta. However, Pibara didn't flinch, despite the Saiyans bracing themselves. Pibara, get back! Broly's out of control! Vegeta shouted. It pained him to say that though, saying that not only his pupil of many years now had lost his cool, but also that he had failed at his own personal mission to better him. After all this time, it seemed like it was all for naught. He'd done nothing to improve Broly's condition. It sickened him to utter those words, even to himself. No need to worry, my friends. This shall not lead to harm. Pibara raised his hands over Broly, and the Saiyan's face eased and his eyes closed, sending the Hulk back into a deep sleep. Wow, if only we knew that earlier, things would have been way easier. You're one to talk, Kakarot. If you hadn't buzzed him when you did, I might have succeeded at calming him down. Then we wouldn't need to be here. Gentlemen, please calm down. Do you need a nap like our friend here? He motioned to Broly, and this was enough to stop the two bickering. So, tell me, Goku, what seems exactly to be the problem? Is this a case of insomnia for your compatriot? N no, mister. It's a lot more complicated than that. Have you got the time? Pibar nodded. I always have time for you, friend. To explain. And with that, Goku explained the whole widget, the saga of Broly to his former master. He told him everything. The events with Paragus and the comet at the beginning, the arrival on Earth entombed in ice, losing his memory, the struggles with God Key, and then up to the revelation of his amnesia slipping away and revealing the truth of Kakarot and his reason for seeking him out all this time. It wasn't admiration, something Broly thought for so long. It was revenge. Pibara took everything in, without flinching or seeming disinterested. I see. This is indeed a very somber affair. So, do you seek guidance from myself? They both nod. Is there anything you can do to fix his memory or make him better? If you're asking me to wipe his mind of your influence, Vegeta, then that would be immoral. Huh? Immoral? Why? Look where that has gotten you all today. Wiping memories. Granted, he would never remember the truth about you, but really, could you live with yourselves knowing that he had been tampered with in some way to make him what he will become afterwards? He would be physically healthy, yes, but his soul would ultimately be clipped. What makes him him would be compromised from its full potential. It might even curtail his power. And that might not be prudent given how everything seems to be getting more and more chock-filled with power these days. Hmm? Right. Goku looked a little put out, but he understood ultimately. Well, what can we do then? If we can't erase his memory, then how can we stop him from lashing out again? said a rather concerned but annoyed Vegeta. There is plenty we can do. I can take him under my wing and assist him in balancing out his mind without the need of amnesia. It did work up to a point, but with my help, we can eliminate that worry of going rogue for good. Does that mean you can focus his key and stuff, Pibara? Like he did with me? said Goku with excitement in his voice. Kakarot, please! This is not the time for you and your desire to fight strong people to show up! This is Broly's livelihood we're talking about! Pibara looked serious, siding with Vegeta. Indeed, you're right, to a point. From what I can sense, his mind is so riddled with trauma. It would either take many years to fix entirely, or, or such intense training in such a short space of time. It could make things worse if it doesn't take. This shocks Goku and Vegeta. Even worse? How could it get even worse? This decision needs to be made by Broly and Broly alone. I understand that you both have his best interests at heart, but this one here also has a say in the matter. Before he wakes up, I do request one thing, that you depart Yardrat. 
This gets under Vegeta's skin. What? Leave him here? Are you crazy? We've had to deal with this outburst firsthand, and barely came out of it with our lives. Oh, Vegeta, I thought you had every faith in your pupil. Is that no longer the case? After seeing his true self, Tabara was right. He just questioned Broly's fortitude, despite backing him up just a few seconds ago. He remained quiet, but Pibara understood the impact of this revelation. I promise you, I will take care of him. Now please, for this to work to the fullest, I must ask you to leave. When Broly is ready, he will come and find you. Only then will he be rid of his demons forever. Goku and Vegeta looked to him, and then to the master. Goku pats Broly's shoulder. Take care, Broly. I hope we meet again, in better circumstances. Vegeta turns away and doesn't say anything. Vegeta? Are you sure you don't want to go say goodbye? Of course not! This is not the last time we shall meet. What is the point of saying goodbye now? Goku looked stunned as Vegeta headed back to the ship. He turned back to his master, feeling worried. Don't worry, Goku. I can tell that he's worried. Let him calm down. Now go. We will be fine. The Saiyan nodded and followed the prince. When Broly came to, he looked around his surroundings. He wasn't angry or out of control or anything. He had calmed down to his base self. He spotted a Yardratian tending to his bedside. He thought he would have been shocked to see this strange thing, but he felt oddly assured by its presence. The attendant then looked up and saw that Broly was conscious and smiled. Oh good, you're awake. I shall go tell master the good news. Wait here. Broly nodded cautiously and sat up in bed, thinking to himself. How did he get here? Pibara arrived a few minutes later and greeted Broly with a warm welcome. Glad to see you are awake, my friend. We have a lot to discuss. Tell me, how do you feel? I feel odd. Like my body's been through a lot that I can't explain. How long have I been asleep? Hmm. Since you got here? About a week. A week? Wow. Whatever happened must have been intense. The master smiled. Good. The rest was sufficient enough to expunge the negative emotions as of late that had been building up. He was now at his most docile. For the time being. You are here, Broly, to learn something rather insightful. Your master Vegeta requested the training. Vegeta? Right. I don't remember him talking about this with me. Are you sure what you say is true? Positive. We Yartratians do not make up such things. Broly nodded to that statement. Well, okay. So what do we do? All in good time. For now, get to know the town. I shall have my assistant here escort you around. With that, Broly got to know the Yardratians very well, and they in turn became very good friends with him. He quite liked the calm nature of these people. It all felt rather tame and quaint. This was crucial in aiding his recovery, and over the months that followed, he and Pibara would focus on his basic training in fortifying his mind. Pibara did have to admit that this task was probably one of the most difficult that he had to undertake in a very long time. However, he was still open to the challenge, and soon enough, he was getting results. Broly's aura was getting far less muddled and much more pliable. Soon enough, the time came to discuss the K-word. Broly, how do you feel when I say the name Kakarot? Broly's arm tensed up, his teeth gritted slightly, and his aura started to boil, even though it wasn't visible. Pibara was a little nervous, but he dared not show it. Any sign of faltering now, and all of this training would be put back weeks, or at worst, he'd be back to square one. The rest of his assistants prepared to sedate Broly, but it wasn't necessary. Broly calmed down and sighed. Kakarot, that name brings me pain, but from a long time ago. Pibara smiled. Of course it would. You have been through a lot, my friend, in your time. It is okay to feel sad about certain things. There is no point suppressing such things. It'll only make it worse. Broly smiled. Thank you, Master. What does this mean? It means, Pibara said, that we can move on now to the real training. Real training? Oh, yes. Now that you don't feel as worked up about Kakarot anymore, Broly's fist clenched slightly, but he remained focused, we can start to refine your energy to the point where all of your output is under your total control. Total control? You possess great power, Broly. 
if used to its fullest at all times, you could be the strongest force for good in the universe. Broly was blown away at this news. To hear he could be stronger than anyone in the universe if he put his mind to it. Maybe even more so than Beerus, perhaps. Well, this excited him, and so began Broly's proper training. The kind that Goku did back in the post nemec saga. Now, I bet you're wondering, actually, well, what's happened to the Tournament of Power in all of this? Well, it still happened, but without Broly. It took a lot of quelling Beerus' temper, but they had to explain that including Broly in the team roster at this stage might not be beneficial, and in fact, it might lead to the team being disqualified, Goku being killed if he was provoked. Instant disqualification. With that in mind, Beerus grudgingly relented, and instead, they went with the same team as they did with the original series. Since their powers differed very little in comparison, we have basically the same outcome from the tournament as we did in the show. You know, Ultra Instinct Goku and all of that, so there's no need to retread old ground here, if you will. However, since this is an April Fool What If, we'll include a little Easter egg we don't usually do for What Ifs, or at least not yet. We shall throw a nod tomorrow here. So let's go. It's been about a year or so since Broly arrived on Yardrat, and his training had been going rather well. He was in the latter stages of his initial meditation training, and was more determined than ever. It had been a snowball effect. The more relaxed and focused he became, the further he wanted to push his boundaries and resolve, which then meant he would focus more and relax more. He had become a whole new person, and with the gift of patience on his side, as well as distance from Goku for a considerable amount of time, and from the battlefield, Broly had never felt better. It was put to the test when, out of the blue, Vegeta arrived on Yardrat. When he was up on the plinth, he turned his eye to the plinth next to him and saw his master right by him, regaled in the same uniform as he. Master! Vegeta turned to him and shushed him. Shh! There's little time to explain, Broly. Soon, I shall tell you. He turned away before turning back again. It's good to see you, friend. Broly smiled. Yes, you too. Vegeta resumed his own training and chuckled. At last, some good news. Broly finished his meditation at the same time as the prince, albeit Broly had a few months head start, obviously, and the two caught up, the latter realising how much calmer Broly had become, and strong. This was of course put to the test when Moro's goons arrived, led by Yuzun, to capture Vegeta and Yardrat, however, with Broly here too, <laughs> yeah, that was no contest. Yuzun and his men were often seconds. Both the prince and his pupil were stunned at their brand new focused key. Remarkable. Broly! You pack as much of a punch as you did when you... <clears throat> yeah. When I got angry. Yeah. I do. But now, I can do it all the time. I see. We could really use your help on Earth, Broly. There is a terrifying power terrorizing not only it, but the rest of the universe. Nowhere is safe. Broly did contemplate this, but he shook his head. No, Master. I'm not ready. I've only just started my proper training like you. If I leave too soon, this might all be undone. I can't risk blowing up in front of Kakarot anymore. You... you said to say your name. Yeah. I can do that now without getting mad. I remember everything from my youth, but... It's alright. Where I am right now... It's a good place. Broly nodded and affirmed his stance. He wouldn't help. It's like I said, Vegeta. When Broly is fully ready, he will return. I promise, Vegeta, I will. Vegeta scowled but understood. Soon enough, Vegeta transmitted out of there and went on to do his bit in stopping Moro's rampage. Years passed. The 25th Tenkaichi Budokai was approaching, and Goku and Vegeta were keen to test themselves in this time of peace. But they then saw somebody. Somebody who honed into view when the two Saiyans are caught up themselves. A tall man with shaggy hair and scars over his face and body. But the smile was warm, soft, and familiar. It was Broly. He looked at peace. He felt normal. And he was happy. And that's where we end things, with Broly finally all good. So what did you folks think? Do you feel this was an apt way to end Broly's struggle with his past? Are you happy that he is happy with his lot? Leave a comment below and let's get this discussion going. And I shall see you in the next video. Catch you later!